हेलो स्टूडेंट्स हाउ आर यू वेलकम टू द डे फोर ऑफ द सी ए फाइनल फाइनेंशियल रिपोर्टिंग मैराथन सेशन इन द प्रीवियस सेशन वी हैव स्टडीड अबाउट लीजेज शेयर बेस्ड पेमेंट्स वी ऑल्सो स्टडीड अबाउट रेवेन्यू एंड देन फाइनेंशियल इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स राइट एंड आई बिलीव द सेशन वेर क्वाइट हेल्पफुल फॉर ऑल ऑफ यू नाउ as i have told in my uh, previous sessions that uh, these are uh, classes or the marathon session will be helpful uh, only and only if after the sessions uh, you guys revise all the concepts and uh, try to solve all the questions and accumulate your queries and discuss that with me okay now if you have any queries uh, you have to discuss with me in the next class for those who are watching in the youtube uh, what you can do is uh, you can reach out to me on this number Can reach out to me on this number and discuss your queries and discuss your queries okay you can whatsapp me on this number you can whatsapp me on this number okay or you can join my telegram group as well now so let's start our uh, next topic that is a uh, business combination and consolidation okay now understand guys uh business combination and consolidation unlike other standard other standards like uh, leases revenue or share based payment for that matter they are governed by one particular standard like for example leases is governed by indias 116 or revenue is governed by indias 115 share based payments is governed by indias 102 but a uh, business combination and consolidation is not governed by one particular standard there are a list of standards and uh, many times i have seen students struggling between uh, which standard to be applied in what scenario okay definitely you are not required to memorize the name and the number of the standards uh, okay not required for the exams not required not required but yes at least you need to understand the applicability of these standards okay so uh, first of all what we'll do we'll list on all the standards along with the names and then we'll understand their applicability okay in which scenario uh, you have to apply which standard is what we have to understand first okay uh, though not required from an exam point of view but yes required from a knowledge point of view a uh, very much okay because if you understand this uh the, the the next point of chapters will become quite easier so let me list down the name of the standards first <coughs> indias 103 then comes indias 110 indias 27 comes in this yeah these are the list of standards which are applicable okay now understand first and foremost 112 dis discusses about disclosures okay so that's a separate uh, disclosures pertaining to all of them okay disclosures pertaining to the business combination and the consolidation it, discuss it discusses only about disclosures it discusses only about disclosures now in this triple one discusses about joint arrangement meaning thereby if uh, two or more parties are controlling a particular entity meaning there is joint control so in that case this uh, triple one standard triple one uh, india triple one will be applicable okay so basically to analyze uh, if there is a contract uh, wherein two parties has come together and to control a particular entity so we have to analyze whether there is joint control or not if there is joint control then it is joint arrangement if there is joint arrangement it is in the nature of joint operation or a joint venture we have to analyze that okay so that analysis will be covered under india triple one now if it is concluded if it is concluded that it is either an associate that the entity is either an associate or a joint venture then the treatment will be covered under india 28 which covers the invest accounting treatment for investment in associates or joint venture and as far as you know uh, we will account for it under equity method now india 27 discusses about separate financial statements now what is the meaning of separate financial statement right like guys all of us know that whenever there is a business combination or a consolidation uh, apart from the uh, financial statement that the parent prepares we prepare the console financial statements also right so in console financial statements we record the net assets we record the goodwill we record the nci uh, and we de-recognize the investments right but uh, understand that is a console fs 
we need to understand what should be the accounting treatment of the interest that the parent has in the subsidiary or the associate or the joint venture or a joint operation in the books of parent company as a stand alone in the books of parent company as a stand alone which is covered under indes one uh, indes 27 indes 27 which discusses about separate financial statements now indes 103 and indes 110 understand indes 103 says uh, we have to apply acquisition method you have to apply acquisition method you have to apply acquisition method okay whenever you acquire a control whenever you acquire a control over any business you have to apply in days 103 you have to apply in days 103 okay basically in days 103 lays down the principles that whenever you acquire any control whenever you acquire in control how to calculate goodwill how to calculate nci how to calculate uh basically uh and how to prepare calculate the fair value of the net assets okay and how to prepare the console financial statements okay but in days 110 says what should be the accounting treatment what should be the accounting treatment of the change in net assets what should be the accounting treatment of the change in net assets subsequent to date of acquisition subsequent to date of acquisition so listen to me carefully here listen to me carefully i am drawing a chart here understand let's suppose a acquires b a acquires b a acquires b so on the date of acquisition on the date of acquisition okay so i have to calculate goodwill i have to calculate nci i have to calculate the fair value of net assets okay and then uh, i have to prepare a console financial statements and all these guidance are covered under in days 103 on business combination okay are covered under in days 103 so on the date of acquisition i will apply in days 103 but understand subsequently on each reporting date subsequently on each reporting date again i have to prepare console financial statements on each reporting date again i will have to prepare console financial statements and you will have to understand this fact that from date of acquisition till reporting date will the value of net assets change yes it will change value of net assets of subsidiary will change will goodwill change no except for impairment will nci change yes due to change in the value of net assets okay will purchase consideration change no it will not change okay so now what have what changes basically what changes is the net assets basically what changes is the net assets so the the treatment of the change in the net assets is governed by india's 110 is governed by india's 110 and hence it says whenever you are preparing console financial statements on each reporting date so in addition to india's 103 you have to apply india's 110 as well okay so that's the that's the uh, overall applicability of each standards okay in which scenario we have to apply which standard is what you have, we have discussed here i hope that is clear i hope that is clear the meaning thereby on the date of acquisition you will apply solely 103 but on each reporting date you will apply definitely apply in 103 but in addition to that you will have to apply in 110 as well i hope that is clear to all of you now let's come to our discussions applicability of the standards as we discussed uh, on the date of acquisition we have to apply we have to calculate goodwill and ci okay uh, basically now nci can be calculated using proportionate share method or fair value method okay and all these guidance is given in 103 is given in 103 okay and basis that we have to prepare console financial statement so on the date of acquisition i will apply only 103 but at each subsequent reporting date subsequently at each reporting date the value of net assets will change and due to which the nci will also change due to which the nci will also change and this change has to be accounted for and the accounting treatment of this change is governed in india's 110 so hence on each subsequent reporting date in addition to 103 i will also apply 110 i hope that is clear to all of you okay now classification of investments guys understand Investments basically see whenever I a parent company has any interest in the subsidiary associate or a joint venture, then interest can be of multiple types. Let's suppose I purchase a uh, 10 shares of Infosys. Okay, is that a subsidiary? No. Is that an associate? No. Is that a joint venture? No. Is that a joint operation? No. Okay, just because it's a 10 shares, it might not be the case. Okay, so what we are doing here, we are discussing the default classification. Okay. I am discussing here the default classification and but uh, definitely I'll discuss other ways otherwise also but first let me discuss the default default means 
if the question is silent if the question is silent you will assume this one meaning thereby if the value interest if the interest is less than 20 percentage okay is less than 20 percentage then we call it as a normal investment in equity shares of a sub, uh, of a company and we account it for as per uh, financial asset as per india's 109 okay if it is between 20 to 50 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 it can be an associate or a joint venture and we have to apply index 28 and do the accounting accordingly if it is more than 50 we can have to call it as a subsidiary assuming there is a control assuming there is a control okay so that's a that's a default classification so what is the otherwise called classification okay let me tell you if the question is silent you have to apply default classification but if the question says it like this the company uh, a limited has a uh, 30 percent of b limited but uh, a limited has the power to take all the relevant decisions of b limited okay meaning thereby even though uh, a limited doesn't have the majority voting rights of b limited but still it has the right to take important decisions of uh, b limited it, it, that means that there is a control there is a control there is a control and if, if there is a control there is a subsidiary so what we have to say otherwise we have to analyze see either in the exam we have to analyze default classification which will be the case if not we will have to analyze if there is a control subsidiary exists if there is a significant influence associate exists okay if there is neither control nor subsidy uh, nor significant influence it's a normal investment to be accounted as per india's 109 financial assets i hope uh, this classification of investments is clear to all of you now the comes the meaning of control and significant influence which we'll be studying in the uh, next session okay as that is in the as part of day five as part of day five okay now okay now this was the classification of investments now comes the accounting treatment of inv uh, investments now comes the accounting treatment of investments now accounting treatment of investments when it comes we have to understand in the sfs of parent in the cfs okay in the cfs of the group in the sfs of parent in the sfs of parent see understand investments is what investment in the equity shares of another company now if we talk about the default classification if we talk about the default classification with the financial asset as per index 109 and has to be accounted as per fbt p and l or fbt oci if held for long term and strategic reasons right that's a default classification that's a default classification but in day 27 in day 27 gives you an option in day 27 gives you an option to record it at cost okay that if the investment in the equity shares of another company if the investment in equity shares of another company is in the nature of subsidiary associate or joint venture please listen to me carefully if the investment is uh, if the investment in equity shares of another company is in the nature of a uh, subsidiary associate or joint venture you can record it at cost you can record it at cost okay okay now understand i'll uh, i'll say explain it here See, if it is a normal investment, do we have an option to record at cost? Do we have an option to record at cost? No, we don't have an option. If it is an investment in the nature of subsidiary, associate or joint venture, it is here we do have an option to measure it at cost. Please uh, note it carefully, okay? Please note it carefully. Here, we do not have an option to record at cost. We can measure it at only at FBT p &L or FBT OCI, okay? Not cost, but here, when it is a subsidiary, associate or joint venture, is then we, I will have an option to measure it at cost. I hope that is clear to all of you. Okay, and this is the reason when you study India's 109 uh, in the last class, I told it very clearly when uh, investment in equity shares is measured at cost, it goes out of the scope of it goes out of the scope of India's 109. Why? Because it gets covered under India's 27 now, right? Now, valuation of the cost of investment, right? please understand why we have to study the cost of investments because understand definitely i have to measure the cost okay whether uh, whether it is measured at cost or fair value definitely i have to measure the cost at least right cost i have to measure only but how to measure the cost how to measure the cost because understand guys what happens when i am purchasing the equity shares of any company when i am purchasing the equity shares of any company i uh, might pay the consideration in gas 
I might pay the consideration in the form of equity shares of my company. I might uh, give a promise to pay uh, subsequently, right? So there can be different modes of settlement. There can be different modes of settlement, okay, of a particular transaction. Now I have to assess that what is the actual value of the actual value of the consideration, okay? That's what is called as the valuation of the cost of investments, and there are a lot of adjustments in this one. So let's study this one, okay? So what I have done is. Uh, in though in our regular classes uh, i discuss uh, first uh, of all these things okay first of all these things and make uh, take up simpler questions and then uh, towards the end i discuss these adjustments but now what i'm doing is i'm taking up all the adjustments at one time itself okay? so that you have a complete overview of the things okay when i'm calculating the purchase consideration these are the only adjustments which can come in the exam and nothing out of it and nothing uh, outside this nothing outside this okay so uh, what i've done is i've tried to list everything possible everything that can come in the exam i have taken up here okay now let's discuss it all let's discuss it all cash consideration okay uh, now consideration can be in the form of cash can be in the form of share exchange can be in the form of deferred consideration can be in the form of contingent consideration and there can be any other adjustments also which we'll discuss definitely now what is the meaning of cash consideration meaning thereby i purchase the shares today i will give you cash what is the meaning of share exchange? I purchased the shares of your company and in consideration, rather than giving cash, I am giving the shares of my company. What is the meaning of deferred consideration? Deferred consideration means uh, I am purchasing the shares of your company uh, and I am giving you a promise that I will pay a fixed amount of money after a fixed period of time and the payment is certain and the payment is certain. I will I am certain that I will pay the money. I will give the money. Okay. Contingent consideration means what? The fixed amount of money after a fixed period of time but the payment is not certain because it is contingent upon some future conditions okay other adjustments can be in the nature of payment to the employees replacement awards pre-existing relationships and acquisition cost okay these are the only adjustments which can happen to purchase consideration for the cost of investments okay so let's discuss each of them uh, one by one in detail okay so uh, we'll start with the first one that is cash consideration okay now understand so uh, when i am discussing the when we will be discussing the cost of investments we will discuss the two type of treatment okay one is the treatment on the date of acquisition one the treatment on the date of acquisition and another is a treatment subsequently will there be any subsequent impact of that uh, settlement consideration okay now understand the first is cash consideration tell me what is the journal entry of a cash consideration it is investments account debit to bank whatever amount we have paid we will write uh, the amount okay investments account debit, debit to bank account now when we purchase anything and we settle the transaction in cash uh, is there any subsequent treatment for that no the transaction gets closed you purchase it you pay the amount transaction gets closed no subsequent treatment no subsequent treatment similarly issue of shares by parent company issue of shares by parent company you purchase the shares of a subsidiary you issue the shares okay the parent company is issuing its own shares okay now the transaction again gets closed i am settling the transaction purchase the shares say the give the consideration transaction gets closed so no subsequent treatment okay but a student does make mistake here what two mistakes mistake number one mistake number one when calculating the number of shares when calculating the number of shares to be issued by parent company to be issued by parent company so please uh, calculate that carefully please calculate that carefully for example i'll say for example i'll take an example here basically it says that i have acquired 10,000 shares of a subsidiary and it says that uh, the parent company issues uh, three shares for every two shares acquired so means three by two is the exchange ratio multiplied by 10,000 shares acquired so the, the number of shares which comes is the number of shares to be issued by the parent company okay this is the first mistake that a student does so please avoid this mistake the next mistake see if you have to arrive, arrive at the fair value of the share exchange then uh, the number of shares the parent issues okay the number of the shares the parent issues should be multiplied by the fair value of the per share of the parent company not of the subsidiary company because we are calculating the fair value of the shares issued by the parent company so though i do have the number of shares issued by parent company 
आई विल मल्टीप्लाई बाय द फेयर वैल्यू पर शेयर ऑफ द पेरेंट कंपनी नॉट ऑफ द सब्सिडरी कंपनी द क्वेश्चन विल गिव यू द फेयर वैल्यू पर शेयर ऑफ बोथ द कंपनीज टू जस्ट टू कंफ्यूज यू बट यू हैव टू बी वेरी मच डिलीजेंट हियर एंड टेक द फेयर वैल्यू पर शेयर ऑफ द पेरेंट कंपनी एंड नॉट ऑफ द सब्सिडरी कंपनी ओके फेयर वैल्यू पर शेयर टेक फॉर पेरेंट कंपनी ओके नाउ so uh, since in the case of cash consideration and in the case of uh, share exchange uh, the consideration the transaction gets settled on the date of acquisition itself and hence there is a no and hence there is a no subsequent treatment hence there is there is no subsequent treatment but let's come to deferred consideration what is the meaning of deferred consideration means i have purchased the shares of subsidiary today but i have not paid the amount today rather i am saying that i am giving you a promise i am giving you a promise that i will pay the amount in the future i will pay the amount in the future so what is the meaning of deferred consideration meaning thereby fixed amount of money to be paid after fixed period of time and the payment is also fixed meaning thereby 3f 3f fixed amount of money after fixed period of time and the payment is fixed it is not contingent upon any conditions it is fixed it is fixed so now if all the three conditions are there 3f are there amount is fixed uh, time is fixed payment is fixed okay then in that case what you have to do is there is the difference of time value of money there is a time value of money component involved here okay though you are required to pay the money today itself but you are not paying the money now rather you are paying the money might be after one year or two year or three years right so what you will do you will have to calculate the value today so what is it called as it is called as the present value so what we will do you will calculate the present value of the amount to be paid in the future and that will be part forming part of the cost of investments okay now what you will do this present value definitely will be the nature of financial liability which you will unwind at every reporting date and record finance costs okay and in the uh, finance cost in the pnl uh, of the parent company in the pnl of the parent company and record a liability in the balance sheet of the parent company okay and now this uh, finance cost and the uh, this liability has to be recorded in the console fs as well okay coming to contingent consideration in contingent consideration it means amount is fixed time is also fixed but the payment is not fixed but the payment is not fixed means meaning thereby it is dependent upon some future contingencies it is dependent upon some future conditions to be satisfied okay so now understand in the deferred consideration there was only a time value of money component involved here okay, there okay but in contingent consideration there are two things involved first is time value of money and the second is probability of whether this amount will be paid or it will not be paid okay probability 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 okay so now in it is in this case we cannot calculate the present value rather we have to calculate the fair value okay we have to calculate the fair value because there is a probability component also involved here so that's the reason we have to calculate the fair value and the fair value will be given in the question but only thing you have to consider is you have to take the fair value on the date of acquisition and not the subsequent fair values okay fair value of the contingent consideration on the date of acquisition now comes the question again in the case of contingent consideration also the cons the transaction doesn't get settled on the date of acquisition and hence there will be subsequent impact there will be subsequent impact so what will be the subsequent subsequent impact since it is a fair value and it is based on probability the probability is an estimate and the estimate can change so the fair value can also change the impact of change in fair value has to go to pnl okay pnl of the parent company and this contingent consideration has to be shown as a uh, liability of uh, the balance sheet of the parent company i hope this is clear to all of you but now understand there is one query which i face in almost all my regular batches which i will discuss that with you A student asks sir uh, why are we uh, recording deferred consideration or a contingent consideration in a console fs why uh, it is an amount payable to the subsidiary company and hence ideally it should be knocked off because subsidiary company would have recorded a similar receivable in its books so why are we recording it a good question but let me explain it off whenever you purchase the shares of a company you purchase from the company or you purchase from the shareholders let's suppose if uh, this is me let's suppose this is me vishal jain okay now i want to purchase the shares of infosys Let's suppose this is Infosys. 
and these are their shareholders. If I have to purchase the shares of Infosys, I will purchase the, from Infosys or I will purchase from the inf, uh, shareholders. I will purchase from the shareholders, not from the Infosys. Meaning thereby, this payable that is deferred consideration or contingent consideration is to the shareholders, not to the company, not to the company. Company remains unaffected by this. Okay. It is to the shareholders. Okay. So definitely it will record a payable, but this company will not record a receivable. Rather the receivable would have been recorded here. The receivable would have been recorded here, right? But we are not consoling this one, right? We are not preparing console FS of this one. Rather, we are preparing console FS of this and this, right? It is because of this reason why we don't knock it off. This is the reason why we don't knock off, okay? I hope this uh, clears your query. Now, further, further, other adjustments, okay? Uh, now, before I go to other adjustments, let me quickly summarize things. Let me quickly summarize things. If it is cash, I will record the investments on date of acquisition at amount paid. Okay. Uh, if it is share exchange, I will record at fair value of share exchange. If it is deferred consideration at present value, if it is continued consideration at fair, fair value. Now, subsequently for cash and share exchange, no treatment, no treatment. Okay. No treatment. Uh, now, but for deferred consideration, it will, uh, we will unwind uh, deferred consideration and record finance cost and pay off the deferred consideration on scheduled date. Now, for contingent question, I will record the fair value change in the PNL. But now, tell me one question: uh, Will uh, these uh, changes subsequently will it change the cost of investment? The question is: Will it change the cost of investment? These subsequent changes will it change the cost of investment? No, it will not change the cost of investments. It will never change the cost of investments. The cost of investment is the value of the date of acquisition, not subsequent. Any subsequent changes, any subsequent changes, whether the finance cost or the change in the fair value of the contingent consideration, will have to be recorded in the PNL. The impact will go to PNL and not to the purchase consideration. I hope that is clear to all of you. Now coming to the uh, other adjustments. Coming to the other adjustments. Payable to employees of acquiry company. Let's suppose now understand what happens uh, when I acquire. Let's suppose uh, uh, <coughs> Tata Group wants to acquire Big Basket. Tata Group wants to acquire Big Basket. Okay, now what happens is uh, Tata Group wants to uh, retain the founder of. Uh, Big basket because he th Tata Group thinks that uh, it is uh, the founder of the big basket uh, because of whom uh, this company is able to grow this much uh, and I want uh, the founder of the big basket to continue in employment to continue in employment even after I have acquired the company even after I have acquired the company okay. So what it does is uh, it pays an amount to the founder of big basket uh, just to remain in the employment even after I have acquired the company even after Tata has acquired the company the overall control of the company and merged the uh, big basket into Tata okay just taking a hypothetical example okay so, but uh, Tata says to the founder of big basket that you please remain in employment okay you please remain in employment and handle the operations of the company. So for that I am paying you 10 crores. So now question comes up is this 10 crore paid on the date of acquisition to the founder of uh, to the founder of uh, big basket forms part of uh, purchase consideration or not so now answer is if it is paid if the amount paid to the employee of the acquiry company amount paid to the employee of acquiry company is for the continuing employment is for the continuing employment that is not forming part of uh, business con uh, purchase consideration that it doesn't form part of investments so it's, it is for the continuing employment it is not a part of the cost of investments hence you have to say it is a prepaid salary and uh, recognized in the PNL as employee benefit expense over the service period okay but if it is paid in the capacity of shareholders now let's suppose the same data uh, gives an amount to the founder of Big Basket because he ha he owned 15% of the interest of Big Basket to acquire the 15% uh, any amount is paid to that person and that amount will form part of purchase consideration. I hope that makes sense to all of you. Okay, so whenever uh, the acquirer company, whenever the acquirer company pays any amount to the employees of acquiry company, whenever the acquirer company pays any amount to the employees of acquiry company, we have to see the reason. If the reason is for continuing employment, that will not form part of cost of investments. But if the reason is in the, if the reason for the payment is in the capacity of them being a shareholder, okay, and we want to acquire their interest. Then it forms part of cost of investments. I hope that is clear to all of you. 
coming to uh, replacement awards coming to replacement awards a very uh, very good question and a very good concept and uh, a concept which has been tested in the exams also twice i believe now understand guys replacement awards what happens uh, right before uh, let's suppose uh, now uh, tata wants to acquire zomato okay zomato has already issued a share based payment plans to its employees okay now i'll write the example here let's suppose uh, this is tata they want to acquire zomato let's take a an hypothetical example zomato has already given a share based payment uh, plans to their employees okay share based payment plan to their employees okay now what happens uh, tata acquires zomato tata acquires zomato and tata has a different share based payment plan for its employees okay tata has a different share based payment plan for its employees now when tata controls zomato definitely zomato becomes the part of the tata group zomato becomes part of the tata group right now tata will definitely want to have a same policy throughout the group so what will tata do tata will uh, cancel this policy this sbp policy and will uh, replace with different sbp awards these different sbp awards are called as replacement awards they are called as replacement awards now comes the question what should be the accounting treatment of the such replacement awards uh, on the date of acquisition and subsequently okay now understand let's suppose under under this uh, share based payment plan under this share based payment plan uh, the employees were required to service for four years employees were required to service for four years okay but and employees already served for two years till the date of acquisition till date of acquisition the employees has already served for two years okay now tata comes and says that uh, my plan is for five years my plan is for five years so since you have already served for two years please serve for three more years please serve for three more years then i will give you the isops for isops now tell me what has happened here what has happened please think logically please think logically the employees has given the services the employees have given the services to zomato for two years and to tata for three years and then the tata will give the whole of the consideration to employees meaning thereby meaning thereby tata got the service for two years uh, sorry zomato got the service for two years but did zomato give anything to the employees did zomato give anything to the employees no but tata received the employee received the benefit for three years but tata gave the whole shop right that is for the five years cost is five years but received the benefit for three years Tata's cost is for five years, but received the benefit for three years, right? Meaning thereby, a part of the cost of Zomato is borne by Tata. A part of the cost of Zomato is borne by Tata. So, don't you think that's a part of the cost of investment? So don't you think that's a part of the cost of investments? right so it says that uh, the pre combination portion okay pre combination portion means the for the portion for which the employees has already given the services to the zomato prior to the date of acquisition for which the isops or the sbp plans will be settled by the tata that is a parent of the acquirer company pre combination award that will form part of the cost of investment meaning thereby a portion of the liability of zomato will be settled by tata a a portion of the liability of zomato is being settled by tata right so why will i why i am settling it off i will add it to the cost of investments i will add it to the cost of investments okay so that's what it says that acquirer company uh, see this that's what this is the diagram please see this diagram Acquiring company issued sales based payment awards to the employees, which gets cancelled. And since acquirer controls the acquiry, now acquirer replaces the awards. Okay. Now, acquirer company replaces the SBP awards issued by the acquiring company to its employees. Acquiring company will issue sales to the employees of acquiring company for the services rendered by the acquiry to prior to the date of acquisition. Okay. Meaning thereby, acquirer company will issue the sales to the uh, employees of the acquiring company for the services rendered by the employees to the acquiry company okay meaning thereby the employees have given the service to the zomato but the sales are given by tata okay now how to calculate this value how to calculate this value it says that what was the fair value of the award that was issued by zomato fair value of the original sbp award issued by acquiry okay how many years the employees has given the service to the zomato two years 
what is the total wasting period total wasting period means higher of original wasting period and revised wasting period original wasting period was 4 years revised wasting period is 5 years meaning thereby out of 5 years 2 years already service is given by 2 years already service is given by already given by employees to zomato okay 2 years already given by employees to zomato okay so what this value will be called as part of cost of investments part of cost of investments now what will be the post combination see this is definitely the pre combination part is added to the cost of investments the pre combination part is added to the cost of investments of the post combination post combination meaning thereby what i will do now post combination i don't uh, i don't uh, want to know anything what was done by the zomato i am not interested in knowing what was done by zomato i am interested in what is my policy right tata is interested in what is the policy of tata rather than what zomato has done in the past okay whatever zomato has done in the past i have uh, adjusted in the cost of investments now what is my policy uh, i will see so what i see is i will see what is the fair value of the replacement awards what is the fair value of the award that i will issue and then i will adjust what is the already adjusted amount in the investments the amount that comes up 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 will be uh, accounted for as per index 102 in the post combination period will be accounted for as, as per India's 102 in the post combination period. I hope this is clear. Definitely we'll take up an example also on this one. So don't worry. Okay. Uh, I hope it is clear to all of you. Okay. Now the next adjustment is a uh, pre-existing relationship before acquisition. What happens here is see, definitely what happens is uh, when uh, Tata acquires uh, Zomato, there might be a case that they do have some pre-existing relationships. They might have some pre-existing relationship in the nature of let's suppose Tata would have given a franchisee to Zomato or might be Tata would have a payable or receivable from Zomato okay might be any or Tata or uh, Zomato might be some litigation going on between them okay so uh, there can be some pre-existing relationships okay and a receivable or payable on that grounds okay so now comes uh, when I am acquiring that company how will I adjust these are uh, pre-existing relationships how will i adjust these pre-existing relationships now understand uh, there can be three types of pre-existing relationships which is discussed in our syllabus okay they are uh, in the nature of payable receivable okay in the nature of reacquired rights and the nature of provision for legal damages understand each of them payable or receivable let's suppose i have a the parent company has a receivable from a subsidiary company the parent company has a receivable from a subsidiary company now what happens if it's a, if it's a receivable if it's a receivable now if i acquire that company if i acquire that company if i acquire that company definitely it will become my own and the receivable is gone and the receivable is gone and the receivable is gone means a uh, asset is gone a uh, asset is gone asset gone is also a cost right it says add to pc if it's a receivable which is foregone now becomes add to pc it's not actually foregone but it says that see when you acquire the company see uh, basically there are two individual parties there are two separate parties and this party says that i have a receivable from this one but when they become one but when they become one definitely this receivable is gone right this receivable is gone because when they become one there is no receivable or payable so they become one so this is when this receivable is gone the loss of loss of asset is a cost loss of asset is a cost right so that becomes a cost and hence it says add to pc it, it will get added to pc and vice versa if it is a payable to subsidiary we will have to reduce from uh, reduce from purchase consideration okay now reacquired rights what is the meaning of reacquired rights let's first understand that let's first understand the meaning of reacquired rights now let's suppose let's suppose uh dominoes i believe all of you have heard this name dominoes right uh, now what happens uh Dominoes have given, uh, let's suppose the name of the Dominoes company is XYZ Limited, okay. Dominoes uh, gave a franchisee to operate in its name to, uh, to a company called as PQR Limited, right. So, uh, basically PQR Limited will definitely pay an amount to XYZ for acquiring the franchisee for let's suppose 5 years, for let's suppose 5 years. Now, and will uh, PQR will record in the books uh, franchisee rights rights in the books of uh, in the books franchise rights it will record but now let's suppose when xyz acquires pqr subsequently if xyz acquires pqr so it will acquire this franchise rights also it will require this franchise rights also so it is reacquiring the rights 
that the it that it only issued okay so xyz limited is reacquiring the franchise rights which xyz himself issued this is called as a reacquired rights reacquired rights rights which i have issued now i'm reacquiring it off okay so now how what should be the treatment for that what should be the treatment for that okay there are two uh, there are two treatments for that there are two treatments one is from a purchase concession point of view and one is from the net assets point of view okay so i'm discussing that separately i'm not merging those two i'm discussing it separately i'm discussing it separately now from a purchase consideration point of view from a purchase consideration point of view now understand whenever there is a contract definitely when xyz issued uh, xyz would have issued this uh, franchisee rights to pqr they would have entered into a contract for a specified period of time right uh, now and in, in, the, in a contract definitely there is a clause that uh, neither the party can uh, close the contract can cancel the contract and if they cancel there has to be a penalty clause for that there has to be a penalty clause for that right so now uh, definitely dominoes know that if it cancels the contract it will have to pay a penalty of this particular amount and now uh, let's suppose uh, dominoes also knows the fair value of the unexercised franchisee rights let's suppose i have issued a franchisee right of five years and after two years i want to acquire the company so there is an unexercised right for three years right so definitely uh, we can calculate the fair value of that also so comes the question what is the amount to be adjusted the penalty amount or the fair value being a rational business person being a rational person what will you do if i say that if you cancel this contract if you cancel this contract okay basically if i'm dominoes is reacquiring that meaning thereby dominoes has to cancel this contract right so now if dominoes has to cancel this contract i have to pay you uh let's suppose 10 lakhs but if dominoes wants to repurchase this uh right and excise rights it will have to pay 12 lakhs tell me uh, what will you do as a rational person you will say no i will cancel the contract let's cancel this contract i will pay 10 lakhs so uh i will adjust 10 lakhs from the purchase consideration i will adjust 10 lakhs from the purchase consideration. basically a rational person would like to adjust a lower amount we like to adjust a lower amount we like to pay settle it at a lower amount we like to settle it at a lower amount okay so settlement amount will always be a lower amount settlement amount will always be a lower amount and now you must say why will pqr why will pqr uh, uh, accept a lower amount because uh, because because xyz anyways control pqr now right so uh, there is no point in, no there is no challenge in that now so it says it says reduce the purchase consideration by settlement amount why reduce now why reduce because because xyz has to pay that amount to franchise xyz has a has a payable of that amount to pqr has a payable of that amount to pqr right payable payable because x it is xyz that is dominoes that that who is cancelling the contract who is cancelling the contract why right so uh, the settlement reduce the purchase consideration by the settlement amount and recognize the settlement amount settlement loss in p l okay now what is settlement amount settlement amount is uh, lower of the uh, lower of fair value of such license or the termination penalty okay what is the fair value the fair value is let's suppose uh, 12 lakhs penalty termination penalty is let's suppose 10 lakhs so i will take 10 lakhs i will take 10 lakhs settlement amount okay because a rational person will take uh, the lower amount of settlement amount the third is uh, if there is any legal damages let's suppose uh, if either of the parties have uh, filed a suit against uh, any of the other parties counterparty so then the settlement amount will be the fair value of the litigation fair value of the litigation amount okay that's what that's how we will have to record this pre-existing relationships i hope it is clear to all of you definitely we'll take up a question on this one and uh, try to resolve this okay but now let's uh and understand the summary so what i've done is whatever we have discussed so far from a point of view of uh, cost of investments i have tried to summarize it here but before that understand uh, any acquisition related cost if uh, the acquiring acquirer company if the acquirer company incurs any acquisition related costs it has to be transferred to p and l it has to be transferred to p and l it is not capitalized with the cost of investments like we used to do in accounting standard design okay it has to be transferred to p and l the cost of investments sorry the cost of uh, acquisition related costs uh, it, it might be the example can be example can be issue costs the example can be brokerage or any other cost uh, stamp, du stamp duty charges or any other costs okay right let's understand the crux of it so definitely the different modes of consideration we have discussed other adjustments payable to the employees of acquiring company if it is paid in the capacity of shareholders we will add to the purchase consideration if it is paid in the capacity of uh, for continuing employment we will not adjust it off replacement awards we will add 
we will add to purchase consideration add to purchase consideration okay now pre existing relationships add or reduce from the purchase concern as the case may be but there are no subsequent treatment for these ones now acquisition related cost will have to be transferred to p and l acquisition related cost has to be transferred to p and l and no subsequent treatment for that is that clear all of you is that clear all of you guys come on tell me okay now let's take up a question please read the question all of you guys come on and try to solve it i'm giving you five minutes time please uh, try to read the question and try to solve all of you I hope the question is visible to all of you. Let's read the question, guys. On 1st July 2021, uh, A Limited acquired 60,000 shares of B Limited. Okay, total number of shares is 100,000, that is 60%. Okay. by paying the following consideration okay cash at the rate of 20 per share okay fine uh, issue of three shares of a limited for every five shares acquired uh, fair value per share of a limited and b limited is 12 and 8 respectively cash to be paid after two years is this much a limited has to pay this much uh, now uh, let's identify this is a cash consideration this is a uh, share exchange uh, this cash to be paid uh, after two years fixed amount fixed amount fixed period of time and amount payment is also fixed so it is a uh, deferred consideration will pay 30,000 fixed amount after three years fixed period but there is a condition so payment is not fixed so it is contingent consideration it is contingent consideration okay uh, NCI has to measure fair value which is 800,000 uh, net assets is 12 22 lakhs okay now let's calculate the what is it is asking you to calculate goodwill goodwill means what purchase consideration plus nci minus fair value of net assets let's calculate the first calculate the cost of investments cash fair value of fair change then uh, deferred consideration contingent consideration uh, effort consideration at present value contingent consideration at fair value okay now let's uh, calculate so 60000 shares multiply by 20 uh is 12 lakhs okay name issue of three shares for every five shares acquired okay fine so it is uh, three by five for every five shares acquired for sixty thousand shares okay now what is the fair value of tell me which one will take 12 or 8 12 or 8 very good we'll take 12 the fair value of the parent company so what is it what is the value tell me guys come on three by five multiplied by sixty thousand twelve four thirty two thousand Now, deferred consideration at present value, uh, present value of 50,000 for uh, two years, 10%. Okay, now. Okay, 50,000 into 12. Then, 30,000 is the contingent presence of fair. What is the fair value? Tell me, guys. Fair value of the uh, consideration on 1st July, that is on the date of acquisition, is 12,000. Is 12,000. We'll take 12,000. Okay. Now, so this is the purchase consideration. Let's add it up. 12 lakhs plus 12,000 plus. Comes to 1685322. Okay. Now that's investment now comes the nci is at fair value right nci 
the is at fair value and the fair value is 8 lakhs the fair value of nci fair value of nci is 8 lakhs so this is the cost of 60 percent this is the cost of 40 percent okay now add it up plus 8 lakhs 24 85322 now less what is the uh, let list what is the fair value of identifiable net assets fair value of identifiable net assets is uh, how much net assets on the date of acquisition is 22 lakhs is 22 lakhs so minus 22 lakhs is uh, how much is 22 lakhs is a uh, 2 lakh 85000 322 this is the value of goodwill on the date of acquisition that is uh, 1st july 1st july what is the date 2021 1st july 2021 but the question doesn't end here but the question says also says calculate the value of goodwill on date of acquisition okay fine we have already calculated that on reporting date that is 31st march 2022 assuming that there is no change in the value of net assets okay between date of acquisition and reporting it understand now what i'm trying to give uh, the message here between a reporting uh, on the date of acquisition and on a reporting date we have to calculate what uh, purchase consideration we have to calculate what uh, nci we have to calculate what net assets then we have to calculate what goodwill definitely on the reporting date on the reporting date on the reporting date purchase consideration will not change it will remain constant net assets the question says is constant so it doesn't change net assets the question says it is constant it doesn't change if the net assets doesn't change if the net asset doesn't change nci will also not change nci will also not change so will goodwill change no change will goodwill change no change but now one more thing even if even if the net asset would have changed and with regards to with, uh, with regards to that nci would have changed will goodwill would have uh, would goodwill have been changed can we say goodwill would have been changed no goodwill uh, would not have been changed why because goodwill doesn't change with the change of the net assets the goodwill doesn't change the change of the net assets rather the goodwill only changes only if there is an impairment loss on goodwill and except for that goodwill will never change except for that goodwill will never change i hope that is clear to all of you i hope that is clear to all of you okay now moving on to the next part next example let's take up this example as well this is on replacement awards Please solve this example guys come on so a limited is acquiring b limited and replaced the existing share based payment awards of b limited the vesting period okay now let, let me draw a limited has acquired b limited b limited has replaced okay and replaced the existing share based payment award of the b limited vesting period of the original award to its employees okay the vesting period of the original award was five years out of which two year the employees have already served okay uh, as per the replaced awards as per the replaced awards further required for uh, okay further service for further service of two years okay further service of two years okay okay now it says the original this the value of this award the value of this award is 65 lakh the value of this award is 72 lakhs okay now what is the amount to be adjusted to PC? Now understand the purchase consideration. 65 lakh multiplied by 2 by 5 is equal to how much? 65 to 2 by 5 is 26 lakhs. So this 26 lakh ideally B would have to pay to the employees, but is paid by A to the employee, but will be paid by the A to the employee because what will happen when uh, the when uh, the parent company acquires the when the parent company acquires the subsidiary, uh, the uh, the responsibility of issuing the shares comes to the parent company, comes to the comes to the A, not to the B, comes to the A, not to the B. Okay, 
अंडरस्टैंड प्लीज अंडरस्टैंड गाइज ओके बेसिकली वट हैपन्स वेन ए हैज अक्वायर्ड बी वेन ए हैज अक्वायर्ड बी वेन ए हैज अक्वायर्ड बी and basically they have operations have merged they have become one company now okay they have become one company now okay they have become one company okay mostly these type of scenario happens when they uh, when there is a, it's a case of a merger okay it's a case of a merger when they merge and there is no existence of b limited now so the responsibility of issuing shares is of a the responsibility of issuing shares is of a now okay so the service was received by b but the shares fully for the 5 years will be issued by a the parent company right so what is happening the a limited is settling a portion of the liability of b limited right that is add that is added to the cost of investments right so this 26 will be added to the will be added to the cost of investments okay but now understand what is the fair value of the replacement award 72 lakhs out of which 26 lakh was added to the pc right so what is the remaining so 72 minus 26 is 46 lakh so this 46 lakh would be will be accounted as per in days 102 subsequently this 46 lakh will be accounted as per in days 102 subsequently i hope that is clear to all of you okay moving on to the uh, next part moving on to the next part that is fair value of the net assets okay so now understand understand so far we discussed about the applicability of the standards then we discussed about the purchase consideration basically we discussed about what is should be the classification of investments the default classification and the otherwise also uh, then we discussed the accounting treatment of investments in the console books and in the sfs of the parent company okay uh, now then we discussed the valuation of the cost of investments the mode of settlement and there are certain adjustments that we discussed and we took up certain examples also on that but now we are starting the discussion of fair value of the net assets because when calculating goodwill we need the purchase consideration we need nci we need net assets we have already discussed the purchase consideration. we are going to discuss the net assets now after that we'll discuss the nci okay so let's start the discussion okay so as we know that uh, whenever a parent company acquires any subsidiary company it acquires the net assets of the subsidiary company at its fair value at its fair value at its fair value so the, the general rule says that whenever a uh, net assets of the subsidiary company are acquired it is acquired at the fair value on the date of acquisition but uh, what happens there are certain exceptions exception to this rule now when i talk about exceptions uh, they are they are special cases they are special cases okay now what are the special cases let's discuss them okay so what i have done is from my analysis of all the past papers from the analysis of the uh, all the ici study material questions okay uh, and all the suggested answers and everything i have uh, made a note of all the important adjustments okay and i've discussed it here okay so let's discuss that so it says first point is intangible assets is uh, see what we do is uh, whenever we are recording any intangible asset whenever we are recording any intangible asset we see uh, whether recognition principle gets satisfied or not if the recognition principle doesn't get satisfied we do not recognize that intangible asset right the same uh, law applies for the we can say uh, ppe or ip also uh, now let's talk specifically about intangible assets now uh, if you can recall in i in day 38 in day 38 we studied a concept called as self uh, generated intangible assets right uh, example can be you can take a brand name example you can take a brand name okay now let me take up an example here let's suppose zomato zomato built its brand name uh, on its own it gets self generated okay it gets self it got self generated now question is can zomato recognize uh, this brand name in its financial statements okay uh, definitely it's an intangible asset it's identifiable it's non monetary it's uh, it doesn't have any physical substance so it's intangible it uh, qualifies all the definition of uh, intangible asset but uh, still it cannot be recognized in the financial statement why because the reason for that is though this intangible asset has a future economic benefits but there are no cost associated for that right the cost cannot be measured reliably for that hence we cannot recognize it because so basically the reason uh, of uh, not recognizing this uh, brand name in the financial statements is it doesn't satisfy the recognition principle uh, of cost not being measured uh, reliably but now what happens let's suppose this zomato itself okay tata acquired zomato now let's suppose tata acquires zomato 
Now when Tata acquired Zomato, tell, think from the point of view of the founders of Zomato. Now when the founders of Zomato will sell the Zomato to Tata, don't you think they will quote a price for this brand name as well? So what happens though this brand name is not recorded anywhere in the financial statements but still when the founders of Zomato will sell Zomato to the Tata they will quote a price for the brand name as well right so what happens here what happens here in a business combination transaction in a business combination transaction this brand name will have a value okay will have a value will have a value okay so meaning thereby the acquirer company when the acquirer company purchases the acquiry company and there is a brand name which is not recorded in the financial statements of acquiry company acquirer company still pays a price for that still pays a price for that okay now what happens here the recognition principle now gets satisfied for the acquirer because the acquirer had purchased it it's not self-generated for the acquirer it's not self-generated acquirer has purchased it so in this case it will be recognized at its fair value on the date of acquisition okay so that's the point now so it says as per India 38 self-generated intangible assets which does not satisfy the recognition principle need not be capitalized as intangible asset however 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 as per India 103 the same should be capitalized in the CFS of the group example you can take the customer list or self-generated brand name ETC okay second tell me as per India 38 again what is the treatment of research and development costs so research costs gets transferred to PNL and development costs gets capitalized right so standard says that now index 103 says that uh, see uh, acquiry company acquiry company had spent some uh, um, some amount on research costs okay which it has transferred to PNL which was correct as per India 38 which was correct as per India 38 but now definitely uh, if some research was done if some research was done and the knowledge was gathered it will definitely have a benefit for the acquirer company okay so standard says if any research costs if any research cost has any future economic benefits which was done by acquiry company which, which was done by acquiry company which was done by acquiry company before acquisition will be capitalized but any research cost done by the group or the acquiry company post acquisition will not be capitalized again India 38 will apply and we will transfer it to PNL okay only the research cost apply uh, incurred till the date of acquisition will be capitalized okay now reacquired rights i believe all of us uh, know the meaning of re reacquired rights because we have already discussed it today itself right now reacquired rights it says that see again what happens here it says that whenever you are uh, though reacquired rights okay reacquired rights you have to record at fair value on the date of acquisition you have to record at fair value on the date of acquisition now we do have a question on reacquired rights also in this question i have tried to discuss uh, the impact from the point of view of purchase consideration also from the point of view of net assets also so that you can get a holistic view of the things uh, of how it needs to be adjusted in the question okay in an exam right now let's take up so it says uh, dominoes acquired x limited okay x limited has previously purchased license from dominoes uh, for 10 years paying rupees 10 lakhs okay the agreed terms in the case of cancellation dominoes had to pay a penalty of 1.5 lakh in, along with unamortized license fees at the end of third year fair value of the license is 13 lakhs other net assets were 28 lakhs agreed consideration 39.5 lakhs okay now so we have to discuss from two aspects reacquired rights so we discuss from two aspects purchase consideration and the fair value of or I'll write here net assets, purchase consideration and net assets. Guys, net assets is very simple. We have to record at fair value. We have to record at fair value. And what is the fair value of the uh, what is the fair value of the license reacquired rights? Tell me, is 13 lakhs on the date of acquisition? Is 13 lakhs. So we will record the reacquired rights at 13 lakhs. That is very much sorted. There's no challenge in that. Now comes the challenge in the purchase consideration. Though we have already discussed it, but still I am discussing it here again so that you get a holistic view of the things. Now, in purchase concession, if you can recall, I discussed that we will consider lower of, lower of what penalty amount and fair value. Fair value is 13 lakhs. Now, what is the penalty? Penalty is 1.5 lakhs plus uh, value of, of unamortized license fees. Tell me what was the license fees uh, that, uh, that X Limited paid 10 lakhs. 10 lakhs was the license fees uh, which X Limited paid out of which three years was amortized means unamortized for seven years 
right so it becomes how much 7 lakhs so it is 8.5 lakhs so what which is lower this is lower so i will adjust this one so what will i do i will reduce from the i will reduce from the purchase consideration now what is the agreed purchase consideration what is the agreed purchase consideration that is 39.5 so what is the uh, revised purchase consideration 39.5 minus 8.5 is 31 lakhs is 31 lakhs now what is uh okay what is the value of net assets 28 lakhs net assets is uh 28 lakhs right uh i believe other net assets okay so 28 plus this is 28 plus 13 28 plus 13 28 plus 13 is 41 lakhs is 41 lakhs 41 lakhs so 10 lakhs is your gain on bargain purchase 10 lakh is your gain on bargain purchase so this is what is the treatment again i am highlighting it see what this is the treatment minus 8.5 plus 13 is the treatment of reacquired rights i believe that is clear to all of you come on guys please confirm if you want you can still have a look at it uh, from a detailed perspective if it is clear to all of you or not Please confirm if it is clear everyone. Come on guys. Okay, let's move ahead now. Reacquired rights is done. The next point is uh, non current assets held for sale. Understand, guys, what happens uh, generally we record the assets and liabilities of subsidiary at its fair value. But if the asset is specifically held for sale, then we will not record it fair value, rather, we will record it fair value less cost to sell, applying the principles of India's 105, applying the principles of India's 105, applying the principles of India's 105. Now, similarly, again. Uh, this was again one of the exceptions you can say again contingent liability and indemnification asset now tell me as per india's 37 what is the general rule for a contingent liability we do recognize it or we do disclose it off we disclose we do not recognize any contingent liability right we recognize provision we recognize liability but we do not recognize contingent liability or a contingent asset right we disclose contingent liability we disclose contingent liability but now in the case of in the case of business combination transaction it says if uh, the subsidiary company has a contingent liability with the in the case of business combination transaction now you have to record the provision for contingent liability you have to recognize a provision for contingent liability okay and further further if there is any recovery asset existing pertaining to this contingent liability you can record a indemnification asset at its fair value you can record a indemnification asset you have to record a indemnification asset at its fair value at its fair value okay again now employee benefits it says provision for gratuity uh, that is a uh, pvdbo present value of defined benefit obligation and leave encashment okay or you can say the plan assets all those things should be measured as per india's 19 should be measured as per india's 19 and not at uh, not at fair value rather the principles of india's 19 shall be hold holding good okay now again leased asset and lease liability we will have to measure as per india's 116 not at fair value okay uh, deferred tax asset and deferred tax liability this is a concept that you have to understand and we uh, and i show you that uh, in the exam we are uh, this type of deferred tax question has come twice see first time uh, it it got asked in november 20 for six marks it got it uh, again it was asked in uh, january 21 for four marks okay so a very easy concept a very easy concept but yes let's understand this let's understand so it says uh, uh, in deferred tax it says see that See what is the meaning of defer tax. First, understand the defer tax. We calculate carrying amount. We calculate tax base. Uh, we calculate then temporary difference as carrying amount minus tax base. Uh, then we can classify this taxable uh, temporary difference into taxable temporary difference and deductible temporary difference. Uh, then all taxable temporary difference we have to recognize. Uh, 
we have to recognize the default tax liability but deductible temporary difference we have to assess for certain limits and then we can recognize a default tax asset or it can it may remain in unrecognized may remain unrecognized right now in the case of a business combination transaction what is the carrying amount of the assets of the subsidiary it is at fair value now what is the tax base tax base means carrying amount as per the tax books if you go as per uh, income tax laws it says the uh, the carrying amount of the asset that or the carrying amount of the asset in the tax books is the carrying amount in the books of previous owner in the books of previous owner okay so what it will become this is the carrying amount so this will become the tax base this will become the tax base okay not this one uh, carrying amount in the books of acquiry okay it will become uh, okay fair value on date of acquisition and on date of acquisition so this will become the this will become the carrying amount this will become the tax base now you have to, have to calculate temporary difference uh, it can be taxable temporary difference it can be deductible temporary difference uh, accordingly you have to recognize the deferred tax asset and the deferred tax liability right so if the fair value that is the fair value is greater than the carrying amount okay so now when i write fair value i mean to say carrying amount when i say carrying amount i mean to say tax base i hope you are understanding this point i hope you are understanding this point okay now if the carrying amount is greater than tax base you have to create deferred tax liability uh, again if the carrying amount uh, is greater than the tax base less than the tax base you have to create deferred tax asset i hope you have understood this point okay now guys uh, again i'm a uh, few things i want to uh, say it again and again that these classes will be helpful only if you are revising it again uh simultaneously okay if you are if you think that uh just by doing these classes uh it will help you uh no 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 these are marathon sessions okay uh this will help you in revision it will help you in revision okay but yes you have to study after this you have to solve questions okay you have to solve questions okay just uh if i am teaching and you are studying along with me it is never going to help uh with with uh with uh whatever subject you're studying or with uh any teacher you're studying okay you have to study on your own self study is the best study okay so you have to study you have to study on your own also it is then only this classes will be much more effective for you okay non controlling interest non controlling interest first understand what is the meaning of non controlling interest okay uh, uh, in my opinion i feel that uh, generally students uh, say that generally student doesn't understand the meaning of non controlling interest so first understand the meaning what happens when the parent company uh, acquires 80% of the subsidiary company when the parent company acquires 80% of the subsidiary company it acquires a control it acquires a control and now you know what what a student says sir uh, entity has acquired 80% control of subsidiary no 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 understand control is different from ownership control is different from ownership control is not equals to ownership no the answer to the control is yes or no either you have control or you do not have control but the answer to per, per, uh, ownership can be 0 percentage can be 10 percentage can be 30 percentage can be 50 percentage can be 100 percentage it can be different 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 right now so if you talk about entity it has 100 percent control meaning full control is with entity for subsidiary okay subsidiary now but sir sir then what is the relevance of this 80% this represents ownership this represents ownership this represents ownership then what about nci sir what about nci so nci does not have control no control no control but has 20% interest that is ownership 20% interest so it doesn't have control so no controlling but it has interest so it's that's why it's called as non controlling interest okay now non controlling interest can be measured at fair value on the date of acquisition or at proportionate share method on the date of acquisition see the difference between nci uh, is only on the date of acquisition subsequently it uh, both the methods are same 
okay the difference in the measurement policy is only on the date of acquisition subsequently both the policy are the same subsequently both the policy are the same so in the date of acquisition either you can measure it for post net share method or at fair value method okay now if it is a fair value method you can measure it using two methods okay using two ways of measuring calculating fair value either the question will clearly specify that this is the fair value of nci or the question will say what is the fair value per share of the subsidiary company and what is the number of shares the nci holds for the subsidiary company okay so accordingly you can multiply and get the fair value of nci or if it is proportionate share you have to just uh, calculate the fair value of the net assets of the subsidiary on the rate of acquisition and multiply the nci holding percentage and you will get the proportionate share of the net, net assets of the nci that's all okay so that's the value uh, valuation of nci okay in the fs it is shown as a separate line item okay now coming to goodwill coming to goodwill now understand guys uh goodwill or gain on bargain purchase goodwill or gain on bargain purchase uh, <coughs> basically how do we calculate is first we have to add the purchase consideration uh, to that we have to add nci okay let's suppose uh, the purchase consideration is 80 percentage uh, the the ownership that we have in the company in the subsidiary 20 percent is nci now here we get the valuation of the 100 percent entity now then you can consider compare it with 100 percent of the net set of the entity and you can calculate the goodwill or gain on bargain purchase uh, gain on bargain purchase nothing but negative goodwill but negative goodwill okay now uh, if you have a goodwill if you have a goodwill uh, you have to record in the balance sheet as a non current asset okay uh, which will uh, not get amortized rather it will be tested for impairment annually okay now uh, gain on bargain purchase uh, uh, will be recorded in uh, other comprehensive income and then in other components of equity but if uh, if the parameters in calculating the gain on bargain purchase is not rational then uh, it can be recorded directly in other components of equity now the and goodwill uh, is full goodwill or it can be partial goodwill depending it is nci as a fair value or nci as a proportionate share method how how uh, the valuation of nci impacts the valuation of goodwill that if NCI is at fair value, it is full goodwill. If it is a proportional share, partial goodwill. How exactly? Let me show it to you. Okay. Though uh, not that required from an exam perspective, but yes. Uh, if you are watching it uh, on the day before exams, please skip this part. Uh, full goodwill. Uh, or I will write here NCI at uh, proportionate share method. And I will write here NCI at uh, fair value method okay uh, now i'll write here uh, that x company acquires 60 percent of y okay 60 percent of y and the amount that uh, x has paid for uh, rupee for rupee 100 rupees 100 okay for rupees 100 the net assets fair value of net assets or let me write here for uh, rupees 55 Okay. fair value of net assets is uh, rupees 100 okay. now nci is as i said proportionate share so i write here 60 percentage and 40 percentage okay here also i write 60 percentage and 40 percentage what is the value of uh, this one 60 percentage is 65 okay now what is the value investment okay and what is the value of net assets Net assets is 100. Net assets is 100. So 60% is 60, 40% is 40, right? So uh, the value of 40% is also 40. Here, when NCI is a proposed net share method, the value of NCI is calculated as a percentage of net assets. As a percentage of net assets. So that is there, right? So what happens? See, the goodwill, the goodwill that comes up here is 5. The goodwill that comes here is 0. Here, the same thing I'm writing here. Uh, this is 65. This is 60 this is 40 but now nci i am taking at fair value let's suppose the fair value of nci is 42 let's suppose the fair value of nci is 42 what happens the goodwill is 5 the goodwill is 2 right so what happens when the nci is at fair value method there is a goodwill for nci as well so now see here the goodwill is only for 60 percent that's why it is called as partial goodwill and here the goodwill is for both the goodwill is for both and that's why it is called as full goodwill that's why it is called as full goodwill i hope that is clear to all of you right now now 
okay so that's a uh, logic behind this one now comes the journal entry in the uh, uh, console financial statements understand guys understand the how is journal entry passed in console fs as we have already studied in the uh, initial part of this class that uh, in the separate financial statements the parent records investment in subsidiary company okay but in console fs what happens what happens the box of investment gets opened the box of investments gets opened and from this box the what they do is the parent company thinks now the parent company thinks that the whole all of the assets and the liabilities of the subsidiary company is controlled by me so i will record all the assets all the liabilities of the subsidiary company as my assets and liabilities okay so i am recording the assets of subsi i am recording the liabilities of subsi okay but what happens though i do control the 100% assets and liabilities of subsidiary but i don't own it 100% i own it 80% only so 20% is owned by someone else so i owe 20% to someone else so i will record 20% for that as nci i will record 20% for that as nci okay now the difference can be uh, okay now further i will derecognize investments okay the amount that i pay to acquire this control then the difference can be goodwill or gain on bargain purchase the difference can be goodwill or gain on bargain purchase that's the that's how the entry is passed in the console financial statements is that clear everyone i hope it is clear everyone guys uh, i am taking a break of 2 minutes here uh, please make yourself comfortable with the topic so far if you have any queries do discuss that with me still then uh, then only i'll move ahead in the class now let's discuss the concept of uh, measurement period what are, what is the meaning of measurement period and why it is required let's discuss this first so to understand this concept in a much more better manner so uh, what is a measurement period is like uh, see guys understand when on the date of acquisition when let's suppose tata wants to acquire zomato continuing with our previous example okay on uh, let's suppose on particular date on 1st of april 2023 Uh, will all the values of fair values of all the assets and liabilities of zomato be made available for 1st april on 1st april itself no it will take time to get it fair valued right it will take time to get it fair valued right so what happens that's the reason uh, this is a concept of measurement period for okay now so it says uh, it says uh, the on the date of acquisition it might not be practically possible to uh, get all the fair values of assets and liabilities are uh, done on that date itself okay on that date itself okay so it's not possible so it says i am giving you concept of measurement period uh, wherein uh, you can uh, get the facts made available which existed on date of acquisition and accordingly uh, fair, you can determine the fair value of the assets and liabilities for the subsidiary company and uh, calculate goodwill accordingly now what happens let's suppose definitely uh, some uh, fair value of the assets and liabilities will be uh, made available or some will something will be estimated and a goodwill will be calculated okay and a goodwill is calculated here okay on the date of acquisition uh, purchase consideration nci and net assets is made available and we calculate goodwill and we calculate goodwill okay now uh, what happens going forward going forward going forward here i got to know a, fa a fact a fact which will which will change the value of net assets and this fact existed on date of acquisition so what will i do i will change the value of net assets i will change the goodwill okay then again going forward going forward going forward again a fact is made available to us but uh, this fact didn't exist on date of acquisition this fact did, didn't exist on the date of acquisition will it change the value of net assets no it will not change the value of net assets okay again i uh, one more fact was made available here one more fact was made available here which existed on date of acquisition okay again i will change the value of net assets and i will change the goodwill accordingly okay so what what it says that if any uh, if any if any new information uh, any uh, information becomes available regarding the fair value of the assets and liabilities and this uh, and the facts and circumstances existed on date of acquisition means this information was uh, uh, was there on date of acquisition it is just made available to us later on okay it was it existed there but it was not available to us means uh, we were not aware about it we were not aware about it okay so in that case i will change the fair value of net assets change the nci on date of acquisition and consequently change goodwill as well but if uh, but if this information 
uh, the facts and circumstances did not exist on date of acquisition then i will not change the value of goodwill accordingly i will not change the value of goodwill rather i will account for this change i will account for this change of fair value of the data sets as per their respective standards okay so now if you have to understand the concept of measurement period in a much more better manner you can uh, think of it like this okay on the date of acquisition on date of acquisition there can be two possible instances there can be two possible instances okay fair value of assets and liabilities are available okay are available fine if it's available you can calculate goodwill done no concept of measurement period here but if it is unavailable if it is unavailable then what we do it says take provisional values take provisional values and calculate goodwill and calculate goodwill okay and calculate goodwill now subsequently if any information is made available subsequently if any information is made available which existed on date of acquisition then accordingly change goodwill change goodwill but if it didn't exist on date of acquisition then uh, as per respective standards as per respective standards further 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 after the measurement period after measurement period gets over then any information is made available to us which existed on date of acquisition then also i will uh, do i will not change the value of goodwill i will not change the value of goodwill okay whether it existed on date of acquisition or not i will not change the value of goodwill i will not change the value of goodwill okay whether it existed on date of acquisition or didn't exist on date of acquisition i will not change the value of goodwill okay so this, this is the concept of measurement period okay now we do have a question on this also uh, let's solve this let's try to read and understand and solve it off okay giving you two minutes time to read the question and understand and solve it off is it visible to all of you the question can you read it Let's try to read the question. It says ABC Limited acquires XYZ Limited in a business combination on 15th January 20X1. Okay, fine. It says ABC acquires XYZ on 15th of January. Few days before the date of acquisition, one of the XYZ customers had claimed that certain amounts were due by XYZ under penalty clauses for completion delays, including the contract. Means uh, a customer of XYZ claimed a penalty for delay done by xyz okay for delay done by xyz okay now now abc evaluates a dispute uh, based on the information available at the date of acquisition and concludes that xyz is responsible for at least some of the delays in completing the contract based on the evaluation abc recognizes one crore so on the date of acquisition so that is on 15th of january on 15th on 15th of january on the date of acquisition that is date of acquisition abc thinks that uh, it has to xyz has to pay one crores xyz has to pay one crore okay now uh, which is the best estimate of the fair value of the liability to the customer based on the information available on the date of acquisition in october 20x1 or in october 20x1 it says within the measurement period the customer presents additional information the customer presents additional information okay as per which abc concludes the fair value of the liability on the date of acquisition to be two crores it says on date of acquisition the fair value of the liability is not one crore it's two crores okay now this one uh, first october is within measurement period is within measurement period so now tell me where, till when the measurement period can continue till 14th of january not beyond that okay x1 x2 okay not beyond that okay now see for further what happens uh abc limited continues to receive uh, and evaluate the information based uh, related to the claim after two, uh, october 20x1 its evaluation does not change till february it says uh, till february it is its evaluation is only two crores only okay but now uh when it concludes okay it says now after in, in february in february it concludes 
that the amount to payable is 1.9 crores is 1.9 crores okay and uh, okay in february it says uh, no in february it says 1.9 crores okay uh, further it says uh, further it says uh, 2.2 crores further it says 2.2 crores now what happens what we have to do is any change any change till the measurement period till the measurement period till the measurement period that is 14th january will have an impact on goodwill will have an impact on goodwill will have an impact on goodwill and any subsequent changes any subsequent changes will uh, not impact goodwill rather you have to account as per india's 37 that is the respective standard that is the respective standard okay now okay i hope that is clear the concept of measurement period now moving on to uh, the next point that is business combination uh, in steps that is it is also called as step acquisition okay now uh, understand this concept see there was there are two ways of acquiring any company one is uh, i go and i acquire 60% uh, at one time itself okay that is called one shot acquisition second is uh, i am acquiring in steps bits and pieces uh, at one time i am acquiring 5% then again 10% then again 5% then again 10% then again 8% 9% again so bits and pieces again i am acquiring and then uh, a stage will come then you have acquired the control or like 20% 15% 30% you will have acquired a control okay so the date when you acquire the control is called as the date of acquisition so in this uh, picture there are three dates given 1st april 20 30th september 20 1st april 22 which one is the date of acquisition so 1st april 2022 is the date of acquisition because it is here uh, i have got the control it is here i have got the control over the acquiring company okay now in case of step acquisition what we have to do and why we have to do is what we have to study here see guys understand the standard says that uh, standard says that whenever is a case of step acquisition you have to uh, revalue you have to revalue the previously acquired interest see this is the date of control so you have to revalue the previously acquired interest at fair value on date of acquisition that is 1st april 2022 sir why are we required to do this i will tell you i will tell you tell me uh, on 1st april 2020 22 you have acquired how much percentage 15 percentage previously you acquired how many 20 plus 25 is 45 percentage right now when you calculate goodwill what will you write investments on 1st april see this value is on 1st april 2022 this value will be uh, for 1st uh, april 2020 and 1st uh, uh, 30th september 2021 30th september 2021 right now when you compare this investment with net assets to calculate goodwill now this net assets will be what fair value on date of acquisition date of acquisition is 1st april 2022 so what is the uh, the net assets you will take on 1st april 2022 1st april 2022 now okay this makes sense but do you think this makes sense do you think this makes sense you are comparing the net assets on this date but you are comparing the investment on this date is it uh, is it a correct comparison no that's the reason why it says fair value on 1st april 2022 okay now this will make a correct representation right that's what it says that's what it says that's what it says okay now that's the reason why we have to uh, remeasure the previously acquired interest at the fair value on the date of acquisition okay i hope you have understood the concept behind that is that clear everyone come on guys tell me is that clear everyone okay fair enough so this completes our part 1 of the business combination and the consolidation topic uh, now we'll be starting with the topic called uh, index 110 console financial statements but before that we'll take a quick break of 10 minutes so that uh, you revise everything if you have any queries you can uh, discuss or if you want to take a break you can take a break accordingly but we can start within 10 minutes okay okay now let's discuss this one so now 
Next, understand. So far, what we discussed was on each uh, on the date of acquisition, what should be the accounting treatment. Now, what we are discussing is now what we are discussing is how the consolidated financial statements will be prepared on each reporting dates. Okay, and as we as you know that on the date of acquisition, on the date of acquisition, we apply India's one zero three, right? And on each subsequent reporting dates. Definitely, we will continue to apply in days 103, but in addition to that, we apply in AS 110 as well. We apply in days 110 as well. Okay, because in days 110 talks about the accounting treatment for the change in the net assets from the date of acquisition to the uh, reporting date. Okay, now. So first step uh, when we get any question on console balance sheet or the console PNL is to identify the holding percentage and the NCI percentage. Okay. Now it might be speci ideally specifically given or you might have to calculate it. Okay. Calculate means the number of shares held by the parent divided by total number of shares. And similarly for NCI is either it will be specifically given or you have to calculate by number of shares held by NCI divided by total shares of the subsidiary company. This is how you have to calculate the shares. Now date of acquisition is what? What is the date of acquisition? The date on which the control over the business is acquired by the acquirer company. Okay, the date when the acquirer ac obtains the date when the acquirer obtains control over the business of the acquiring company is called as the date of acquisition. Now, now what happens on each reporting date, guys? Come on, listen to me properly. On each reporting date, we have to calculate the statement of net assets. NCI, console reserves and goodwill or gain on bargain purchase. Now tell me, will goodwill change uh, from the date of acquisition? No, it will not change. It might change due to you can say uh, good impairment loss of goodwill. Otherwise, it will not change. The statement of net assets, yes, net assets will change. Net assets will change. Okay. Will NCI change? Yes, NCI will change. Okay. Uh, due to change of the net assets. Okay. Console reserves, yes, it will change. Okay. Now. Let's understand each of them one by one a statement of net assets guys as you know that uh, the net assets that we acquire the net assets that we acquire on the date of acquisition it should be at it should be at fair value it should be at fair value it should be at fair value on the date of acquisition not subsequently only on the date of acquisition it should be at fair value so what will you do first we'll take the carrying amount of the net assets see net assets means what uh, assets minus liabilities assets minus liabilities also equals to equity right so we are going by the equity method meaning thereby uh, we are writing here uh, share capital retained earnings general reserves so that is equity plus all the reserves equity plus all the reserves will add that will give that will give you the uh, carrying amount of the net assets that will give you the carrying amount of the net assets now you have to do the fair value adjustments now you have to do the fair value adjustment how will you do so uh, whatever is the fair value gain or loss you will record now on the date of acquisition okay so you will compare the carrying amount of the asset with the fair value uh, whatever if, if there is a fair value gain we will call the fair value gain if there is a fair value loss we will call the fair value loss but and that accordingly we will arrive at a fair value of the net assets on the date of acquisition see in this case i have adjusted both fair value of gain fair value loss okay it can be anything it can be anything now if it is a fair value gain you have to give a consequential impact if it is a fair value loss again it will be have a consequential impact right so uh, fair value gain or loss of non-current assets will have a consequential impact in the form of excess depreciation fair value loss on non-current assets will have a consequential impact in the form of uh, a shortfall of excess shortfall of depreciation okay now fair value gain or loss on uh, current assets will have a, again consequential impact on the post acquisition period so the consequential impact will be in the post acquisition period will be in the post acquisition period okay now so what will happen now after arriving at the fair value of the net assets on the date of acquisition this value will be helpful in calculating the goodwill in calculating the goodwill in calculating the goodwill now the post acquisition profits understand understand we have the uh, date of acquisition we will have the post acquisition right so now understand the change in the reserves or retained earnings between date of acquisition and re a reporting date is what is the profit earned is nothing but is called as profit earned between date of acquisition and retained uh, and reporting date and reporting date profit earned between uh, this one right profit now you have to adjust uh, the consequential impact the unrealized profit uh, all other things that has to be adjusted in the post profit period you have to adjust that and arrive at the uh, profit of the post acquisition profits now this post acquisition profits you have to add to console reserves and the nci accordingly proportionately so the uh, the 
parent share will add to console results and the NCI share you will add to NCI accordingly, right? This is what is called a statement of net assets. Now, adjustments. In a statement of net assets, these adjustments are very important, guys. These adjustments are important. Okay, now, time adjustment. Guys, understand, practically it is uh, not the case, uh, practically it will never be the case that a subsidiary is either uh, ideally acquired uh, uh, ideally acquired at the start of the year or at towards the end of the year. No, no, it can be acquired uh, at any given day during the year, right? Might be on the, might be uh, odd, uh, odd dates like uh, you can say 15th of August, might be you can say 13th of September, might be you can say uh, 20th of November. It can be on any particular date, it can be any on any particular date. The question that arises is how will you calculate the uh, carrying amount or the fair value of the net assets on that particular date? The uh, carrying amount of the net assets means what? Okay, or fair value of the net assets means what? On date of acquisition means what? Carrying amount of the net assets plus fair value adjustment, right? Carrying amount of net assets means what? Uh, equity capital plus reserves, right? Equity capital, assuming it will remain the constant as on the start of the year or in the date of acquisition, assuming there is there will be no issue of shares or, or if there is an issue of shares also, we can definitely calculate. But question comes up, how will you calculate the retained earnings on that particular date or reserves on that particular date? So for that, the standard says that there are multiple ways of calculating. Depends how the question is asking. The, the, there are three ways of uh, asking. First is the question will specifically give you that on the date of acquisition this is the value of reserves no challenge the question directly gives you no challenge okay fine if the question doesn't give you directly but the question says that see at the start of the year my retained earnings is this much at the end of the year my retained earnings is this much now how will you calculate my question is see please listen to my question carefully you have acquired a subsidiary uh, somewhere here okay this is first of april this is uh, let's suppose uh, 31st of march uh, this is 30th of september okay uh, at the start of the year uh, this is uh, 10 okay retained earnings is 10 lakhs uh, and at the close during the uh, closing re is 13 lakhs okay now uh, tell me how will you tell what is the re here what is the re here how will you calculate that it will be challenge so standard says that standard says that you can take the movement 3 lakh is the profit earned during the year but now it will the question will not be that simple question will also say in the in this question question will say dividend paid by subsidiary during the year is 2 lakhs now how will you adjust this one so let's prepare the re account let's try to prepare re account re opening is uh, 10 lakhs closing is 13 lakhs dividend paid is 2 lakhs dividend paid c by d v by d so what is the profit is 5 lakh so if you make a mistake of adjusting 3 lakhs that is 1.5 year 1.5 year your answer is wrong your answer is wrong my friend what you have to do is first add back the dividend add back the dividend to the profit so make it 5 lakh and then uh, 5 lakh it is 2.5 2.5 right so the re will be 12.5 not 11.5 the re will be 12.5 not 11.5 and that's a mistake that a student does in the exam so please be careful when the opening re closing re and the dividend paid is given so first calculate the movement then add the dividend paid a uh, dividend paid by the subsidiary dividend paid by the subsidiary listen to me carefully dividend paid by the subsidiary to the movement okay that will give you the correct amount of profits now distribute the profits evenly now distribute the profits evenly in the pre period and the post acquisition period pre acquisition period and the post acquisition period right so opening balance plus the pre acquisition period uh, profit give will give you the re on the date of acquisition this is how you have to calculate now the third way question will clearly give you that this is the profit earned during the year now if the question clearly gives you the profit earned during the year you can distribute it over evenly you can distribute it evenly between the pre period and the post period okay so these are the three ways in which the question has given you the time adjustments which you have to be careful which you have to be careful which you have to be very careful now second dividend adjustment guys as i was talking about dividend adjustment right now 
So you have to add back the dividend you have to add back the dividend in the statement of net assets of subsidiary only when you are considering the movement only when you are considering the movement if you are considering the profit if you are if the profit for the year is given then do not add back the dividend then do not add back the dividend then do not add back the dividend because see the only intent to add back the dividend to the movement is to arrive at the correct amount of profit and if you and if you are aware of the correct amount of profit then why to add back the dividend right so do not add back the dividend in that case now this is sorted i believe uh, now reduce this is uh, this is a challenge here reduce dividend uh, from the parent uh, receive a parent from console reserves and nci portion from nci why why do we need to reduce dividend okay i'll give you the logical explanation for both of them understand when the parent and the subsidiary both are working uh, separately right so dividend uh, sub subsidiary 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 gives dividend and records dividend expense and parent receives dividend and records dividend income so it has recorded expense it has recorded income but when we are preparing console fs means uh, console fs means what the objective that they are one entity now they are one entity now they are one entity now now is it making uh, make sense where that one entity records in, uh, expense and one entity record income no so that's a that's a contra item that has to be eliminated that has to be eliminated right so that's the reason the portion of the dividend received by the parent company has to be eliminated as a contra item okay that's the reason why we reduce dividend received by the parent from the console reserves and now uh, sir you will say that sir i definitely understood that uh, why we are reducing from the console reserves for the parent share but why nci share but why nci share very good question Explain, let me explain what is the meaning of nci the amount that we owe to nci um, nci means the amount that we owe to the uh, 30 percent or the 20 percent shareholders right if we if the from the amount that we owe we pay a portion don't you think we should reduce the amount that we owe let's suppose i say that i owe an amount of 10 rupees to you and out of which i already pay two rupees don't you think i should reduce that amount right so that's the reason i am reducing it from nci okay that's the dividend adjustment now coming the impact of fair value of net assets that is very much uh, clear i believe to all of you uh, just uh, okay now the fair value of net assets so what happens guys understand uh, the fair value gain or loss on the rate of acquisition should be added on the date of acquisition right uh, any consequential impact will be adjusted in the post acquisition period that's the impact of fair valuation of net assets now unrealized gain on inventory unrealized gain or loss on inventory okay unrealized gain on inventory now understand it can be upstream it can be uh, it can be downstream it can be upstream let me write here okay it can be downstream it can be upstream downstream means uh, parent sells to subsidiary upstream means what uh, subsidiary sells to parent okay subsidiary sells to parent now in this case downstream tell me who earns the profit who earns the profit parent earns the profit right so i have to re uh, i have to re uh, remove unrealized profit so parent earns the profit subsidiary has the inventory so from parent books i will reduce what console reserves console p l console p l console p l right and for subsidiary books i will record what re reverse what inventory right now here uh, in upstream who has recorded the profit subsidiary so from where i will reduce uh, statement of net assets and from parent uh, has the inventory so i will reduce inventory here right and i believe you all guys already know to calculate the value of unrealized profit so i'm not discussing that aspect here okay that's the entry general entry will be uh, in case of downstream will be uh, console pnl or the console reserves account debit to inventory uh, in the case of upstream will be a uh, statement of net assets of the subsidiary account debit the post acquisition part the post acquisition part the post acquisition part account debit to inventory i hope that is was very much clear to all of you now unrealized gain on uh, non current assets okay uh, this is uh, wrong here uh, let me write the correct part unrealized gain on uh, non current sets the treatment is uh, the same as uh, inventory but the calculation is little bit different the calculation of unrealized profit is little bit different so i am discussing that it says carrying amount of non current assets that is the, that is recorded in the books of the uh, company who has purchased the non current assets minus carrying amount of non current assets 
if it was transferred if it was transferred at no profit or at carrying amount it was uh, transferred at carrying amount uh, then uh, what is what is should be the carrying what should have been the carrying amount the difference of this is the unrealized profit on transfer of non current assets either between parent to subsidiary or between subsidiary to parent okay now bonus distribution by subsidiary guys understand the treatment of bonus distribution by subsidiary uh, is very simple the only mistake that a student does in the exam is i'll tell you the question will say uh, a limited acquires uh 10000 shares of b limited b limited has 15000 shares on the date of acquisition okay subsequently subsequently b limited issued bonus shares in the ratio of 1 is to 1 okay now the ba the balance sheet of b limited will be given in that 30000 will be given now once you are calculating the holding ratio what will you do is 10000 by 30000 Right, you will calculate ten thousand by thirty thousand, and you will say it is ten. Uh, it is, it is thirty three percent only. Okay, though you will solve the question correctly, assuming that uh, control is there. Assume con assuming control is there. Uh, uh, but uh, control is there through contractual rights. Okay, you will solve the question, but that will be wrong. But that will be wrong. Why? Because this fifteen thousand thirty thousand. So if bonus was one to one, this would also have got bonus sales, right? So this would also have become twenty thousand now. So it should be 20,000 by 30,000 uh, the, and the amount should have been 66.67 uh, percentage. I hope that is clear to all of you, right? So be careful in the holding ratio, in the holding ratio. I hope that is clear to all of you. Now, further, NCI on each reporting dates. As I told that NCI can be at fair value, can be at proportionate share. Uh, the difference that it makes is NCI, the only on date of acquisition that NCI can be at fair value on date of acquisition or proportionate share method on date of acquisition. Subsequently, it will be the same. That is, we have to add post acquisition profit sub C. We have to add post acquisition profit sub C. We have to reduce uh, dividend paid to NCI. We have to reduce dividend paid to NCI. Now again comes the difference is uh, dividend goodwill impairment loss. Goodwill impairment loss. Understand when NCI is at fair value, goodwill is for parent and NCI both. So whenever there is an impairment loss, it will for parent and NCI both. So we have to allocate the goodwill impairment loss to NCI. But if the NCI is a proportionate share, goodwill is only for the parent. So NC the impairment loss will be allocated only to the parent. So if there is an impairment loss when NCI is a proportionate share, a proportionate share method, it will not be allocated to NCI. I hope that is clear to all of you. Now, goodwill or gain or bargain purchase on each reporting date, as you are very much aware of it, that uh, goodwill on the date of acquisition minus any impairment loss, if any, uh, will give you the goodwill uh, on uh, reporting dates, on each reporting date. Subsequently, uh, if NCI is at fair value and there is an any impairment loss, any impairment loss, uh, allocate the impairment loss to parent and NCI in the ratio of their holding. If it is at proportionate share, allocate 100% of the impairment loss to parent only. Why? Because full uh, it proportionate share means partial goodwill. Right? Uh, fair value means uh, full goodwill. I hope that is clear to all of you. Now comes the console reserves. Uh, the format is given, right? You can uh, you have to add the parent share, then a post acquisition share of the uh, uh, sub C associate or joint venture, additional any additional depreciation unrealized profits basically dividend receipt from subsidy you have to uh, uh, reduce it off right uh, dividend receipt from associate you have to reduce parent share of the goodwill impairment loss you have to adjust and then it will be on the reporting dates okay that's uh, very much simple i'm not going into much detail i believe all of you can definitely you are able to solve it off right now comes the console balance sheet two important points which you have to take care in the console balance sheet if a question comes on console balance sheet you have to take care of few important points first thing is it will be definitely line by line consolidation you have to recognize goodwill you have to recognize nci definitely all those things are very much clear i believe now eliminate contra items uh, okay now but please take care of in transit items there are certain cases of goods in transit there are certain cases of cash in transit so please be careful 
Now, do not forget to unwind and record deferred consideration. Unwind and record finance costs in the PNL and deferred consideration in the uh, the up uh, the unwinded deferred consideration in the balance sheet as finance liability. Okay, and do not forget to record contingent consideration at its fair value and the uh, fair value changes in the PNL. Okay, so please do not forget all these things and you will be preparing console balance sheet balance sheet correctly. Now, console PNL again line by line consolidation, but under, under uh, remember to adjust the timing uh, timing adjustment, uh, but do not adjust the percentage adjustment. Okay, what is the meaning of that? Okay, what is the meaning of that? A Limited acquired sixty percent of uh, B Limited on thirtieth uh, of September. Okay, uh, so balance sheet. Uh, so now what you will do? You will take for A percent fully, A fully for PNL for PNL. I am talking for, for A. Fully, fully that is a full revenue of a full cost of sales of a full gross profit of a full admin expense of a full operating expense of a uh, full uh, finance cost of a full uh, operating profit of a full uh, net profit of a uh, full tax expense of a everything plus you will take b into 6 by 12 but multiplied by 60 percent you will not do this one you will have to do this one Please remember this one. Please remember this one. A student makes a mistake here. They do this one, and they uh, and they they do this one, and they forget this one. So please uh, take care of this one. Please take care of this one. Okay. Uh, very small point, but yes, uh, it can save you uh, very good numbers. Okay. In the now eliminate a dividend income from the subsidiary okay console revenue will be a uh, revenue of the parent plus revenue of the subsidiary uh, plus within group sales okay now console cost of sales will be so, uh, sales or cost of sales of the parent subsidiary uh, in within the groups uh, within the group uh, cost of sales right uh, within the group sales plus unrealized profit okay for plus further don't forget do not forget do not forget do not forget to adjust the amount attributable to the owners of the company and to nci do not forget to adjust that do not forget to adjust that that's a very important adjustment guys do not that's a very important adjustment please do not forget to adjust uh, uh please do not forget to show uh the amount that is attributable so you have to show it for two things profit for the year uh, and total comprehensive income for the year okay so you have to show for two things uh, amount attributable to the owners of the company and to the nci okay now how to calculate profit attributable to nci basically you have to take the pro start from the profit uh, earned by the subsidy during the year and all the adjustments which impact the profit of the subsidiary all the adjustments which impact the profits of the subsidiary you have to adjust it here okay uh, but remember one important point goodwill impairment adjust only if nci is at fair value because if NCI is a proportionate share method, goodwill impairment loss will not impact the uh, will not impact the NCI part, and we are calculating the NCI part here, right? So uh, goodwill impairment loss adjust here if and only if if and only if it impact uh, if NCI is at uh, fair value, okay? So otherwise impact or impact here all the given impact of all the adjustments here, which impacts the post acquisition profits of the subsidiary company, which impact the post acquisition profits of subsidiary, subsidiary company. It can be consequential excess depreciation. It can be consequential. Uh, you can say uh, unrealized profit. It can be anything, okay? Now. Console, console cash flow console cash flow it is again line by line consolidation uh, and eliminate any intra group uh, transactions basically within the group cash transactions now again comes the concept of loss of control and a sale or purchase without change of control with that i'll discuss uh, but before that i want to take up a question with you guys okay this question has been tested in may 2022 uh, question number 1a for 15 marks okay this concept uh, in this question we'll be solving uh we will be preparing console balance sheet on the date of acquisition okay on the date of acquisition okay so uh i have taken up this question considering it covers a majority of the concept that we have discussed so far okay now let's start to discuss this question uh there was few typing error in this question so what i've done is uh not from uh, not done by ICI, done by me okay uh, uh i am accepting my mistake so what i've done is uh, basically done by the typist so what I have done here is I have typed the correct the mistaken part. Basically, this part will miss to include here. So I have written it here. Okay. Those of you who have purchased the book, you can adjust it. Okay. Definitely in the next editions of the book, it will be rectified. Now, now guys, 
uh okay so it says uh the balance sheet of the j limited and k limited is given on the 31st march 2021 uh it is ppe investments inventory is given trade receivables cash and cash sequence others is given okay equity share capital others uh okay all the details are given now some other informations are given okay fine now it says that uh j limited acquired 75 percent shares of k on 1st april 2021 guys understand understand this is 1st April 21, this is 31st March 21. Uh, does that mean the investment done by the J Limited, investment done by the J Limited in K Limited is recorded in this investment? No. Why? Because this investment is dated 31st March 21 and the investment is done by on 1st of April 2021. Okay. I hope it is very much clear to all of you. Now, so it says what? It says uh, by issuing two uh, ratio shares in the ratio of two shares, okay, for every three shares acquired, the fair value of the shares of J Limited, okay, is uh, 50 per share. Uh, fair value exercise is given, okay, fair value of the net assets is given, then uh, some additional things are given, okay, fine, 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 uh, okay, it's asked you to prepare console balance sheet. Now, let's start, let's start solving the question. We'll start with working note number one. First, we'll calculate purchase consideration. Purchase consideration is what? Uh, fair value of share exchange. Now, 75% shares of K Limited. So now K Limited has now how many shares? See here, K Limited has a share capital of 450 uh, lakhs, has a share capital of 450 lakhs. Each share is worth 100. So 450 lakhs divided by the phase value is 100. So this will give you the number of shares of K Limited. I have acquired uh, for 75%. I have acquired 75% shares. Okay, I have acquired 75% shares. And now uh, J Limited will issue two shares for every three shares acquired. This is the number of shares to be issued by J Limited in exchange of uh, acquiring the shares of K Limited. Okay. Now what is the fair value of uh, J Limited? 50 per share. What is the value? 450 divided by 112.5. Right? Now further, so this point is sorted. First number point is sorted. Second is fair value of the property is for net assets. So I'm keep I'm parking it as of now. Second point. J Limited uh, also agreed to pay an additional payment as consideration. Please read this point, it's very important. That is higher of 45 lakhs. It says additional payment, which is higher of 45 lakhs or 30% of uh, excess profits. Tell me, can I calculate 30% of excess profits today? Can I calculate that? No, I cannot. Right? But 45 lakhs I can definitely calculate, right? Now it says definitely it says higher. Definitely it says higher. Meaning thereby, if this is 60 lakhs, I will pay 60 lakhs. Uh, if this is uh, if this is 30 lakhs, I will pay 45 lakhs. Meaning thereby, definitely I am going to pay 45 lakhs in any any scenario. Definitely I am going to pay 45 lakhs in any scenario, right? So what will happen? This 45 lakh, this 45 lakh, this 45 lakh. Okay, will become a deferred consideration. Will become deferred consideration. Why? Because it is fixed. The timing is fixed. That is, after three years, the timing is fixed, and the payment of this 45 lakh is also fixed. Right? This is also fixed. So this is deferred consideration. So we'll record the present value of it. So present value of deferred consideration that is 50 lakhs. No, so not 50. 45 lakhs. 45 lakhs divided by what is the discount rate given? 10%. 1.10 to the power 3 years. That comes to how much? 0.81 lakh. 3.81 lakh. Now further. This is also sorted. So first point is sorted. Uh, B1 is B2 is sorted. The third point. Please read the third point. This point. Please read this point. And tell me what shall we do with this one? Uh, and I, I can guarantee that we have studied to in today's class itself this point. Come on, guys, tell me.
what it says that uh, J Limited also agreed to pay to one of the founder shareholders a payment of 22 lakhs, uh, 22 lakhs provided he stays, provided he stays, provided he stays with the company for three years after the acquisition. Is this a payment made to the employee of the acquiring company? Is this a payment made to the employee, employee of an acquiring company? Yes. Is it made for continuing employment or in the capacity of them being a shareholder? It's for continuing employment. If it's for continuing employment, will we include as part of the cost of investments? No, no, no. Right now, K Limited had a certain equity settled share based payment award uh, which got replaced by the new awards issued by uh, J Limited. Okay, as per the original terms, the vesting period has been okay. Now, uh, there, is, uh, the, there is again a challenge in the question here, so I will uh, show you the exact question just a minute. Please refer the question. K Limited had certain equity settled share based payment uh, award, original award, uh, which got replaced by the new awards of issued by J Limited. Means K Limited has given to its employees some share based payment plan, which was uh, which uh, when uh, J Limited acquired K Limited, J Limited replaced those awards. Okay. So now what we have to do? We have to uh, calculate pre combination and add to the cost of investment. And for the post combination, we have to account as per India S102. So now, how will we do that? We will take the fair value of the original award, that is six lakh. That is six lakh. We will multiply the service of the the service period uh, of the employees, which is already which they have already served for the acquiring company. So now, see the see what is the period? They have already served two years of service. Okay, and as of the date of acquisition, the employees of K Limited have already served two years of service. Right now, so divided by the total vesting period, which is higher of original vesting period or the revised vesting period. So, what is the original vesting period? Five years. What is the revised vesting period? Reduced to one year means two plus one, that is three years. I will write it off here. Fair value of original award is 6 lakh, uh, replacement award is 9 lakhs. Now, so what you have to do is you have to write uh, 6 lakh, that is the fair value of original. I write a pre combination award is equals to uh, pre combination award is a uh, fair value of original award multiplied by uh, period of service. Uh, given by employees to acquire a company to acquire a company divided by total vesting period now this total vesting period is higher of original vesting period and revised vesting period original vesting period was five years out of which two years employees have already served okay now as per revised vesting period it says the employees are required to serve for one more year that makes it three year that makes it three year so which one is higher five years so i will write here five years so what is the fair value of the original award fair value of the original award is six lakhs six lakh what is the period served by the uh, employees to the this one two years so what is the value six to two by five is 2.4 lakhs 2.4 lakhs so what is the value 112.5 plus 33.81 plus 2.4 148.71 is the value of the purchase consideration i hope it is clear to everyone guys uh, those of you uh, who are not able to see the question this question is from may 2022 this question is from may 2022 question number 1 a 15 marks okay so you can refer the question from there as well the in uh, the value of the purchase consideration is 148.71 i hope that is clear to everyone now what will we do is we will calculate net assets working note number two is net assets Now, 
So first, let's suppose calculate carrying amount of net assets. Let's calculate carrying amount of net assets of uh, K limited. That is, uh, share capital is four fifty and other equity is two hundred ten. Four fifty plus two hundred ten. I'll write here uh, share capital is 450 and other equity is 210 that gives the carrying amount as 660 now the fair value adjustment so this is also done this is also done right now the two adjustments are pending okay so let's adjust the fair value of the net assets Fair value of the property plan and equipment of K limited is 425 lakhs. So, what is the carrying amount of the property plan and equipment of K limited is 500. So, property plan and equipment of K limited has a carrying amount of 500, but the fair value of 425 means fair value loss of 75 lakhs. So, I will adjust here fair value adjustment, fair value loss on PPE of 75 lakhs. Now, further. So this is also sorted this is also sorted now this is done this is done this is done uh, this one uh, k limited has a lawsuit pending with a customer who made a claim of 75 70 lakhs means a contingent liability management reliably estimated the fair value of the liability to be 7.5 lakhs okay now so i have to record this contingent liability also 7.5 lakhs now further this is also sorted now applicable tax rate for the both entities is 30 percent means defer tax defer tax defer tax see defer tax is for fair value adjustment as i have told so what is the fair value adjustment 75 and 7.5 wherein wherein what happens what happens understand carrying amount tax base carrying amount and tax base so the difference is 75 and 7.5 75 plus 7.5 is 82.5 the temporary difference is 82.5 temporary difference is 82.5 wherein 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 what happens tax base is greater than carrying amount tax base is greater than carrying amount why exactly because carrying amount is equals to fair value right and tax base is equals to carrying amount of the in the, in the hands of previous owner right fair value loss is there right so what happens tax base is higher tax base is higher and this will be deductible temporary difference and hence we will record default tax asset what is the tax rate 30 percent if i'm not wrong 30 percent right so you will record default tax asset assuming the limits are passed uh, so default tax asset is how much uh, 82.5 into 0.3 is 24.75 okay so what is the value here 660 minus 75 uh, minus 7.5 plus 24.75 is 602.25 is the fair value of net assets on date of acquisition right now you do have the fair value of the net assets you have the pc purchase consideration now let's find non-controlling interest is the question saying anywhere about the non-controlling interest definitely not in the last paragraph uh first paragraphs everything we have read no so question is silent about nci so we'll take it at proportionate share method we'll take it at proportionate share method so working note number three working note number three is nci at proportionate share method that is 602.25 that is the value of net assets on the date of acquisition multiplied by 25 percentage is how much 150.56 i hope it is clear now uh, we have uh, everything so we can calculate goodwill also right uh, goodwill or gain on bargain purchase right so what is the value of uh, investments investments is uh how much 148.71 nci is how much 150.56 uh, less fair value of uh, net assets is how much 602.25 so this gives you i think uh, nc uh, gbp 
प्लस वन फिफ्टी पॉइंट फाइव और माइनस सिक्स जीरो टू टू फाइव इज थ्री जीरो टू पॉइंट नाइन एट नेगेटिव गुडविल मीन्स गेन ऑन बारगेन परचेज आई होप दिस इज क्लियर टू एवरी वन टिल हियर लेट्स प्रिपेयर द बैलेंस शीट लेट्स प्रिपेयर द कॉन्सोल बैलेंस शीट नाउ non current assets uh, ppe now tell me what is the value of ppe 400 plus 500 uh, minus uh, the fair value adjustment of 75 400 plus 500 minus 75 then what investments is uh, 450 plus 120 investments is uh, 450 Plus one twenty guys. If uh, if I am making any mistake in posting, please uh, do let me know. There can be a case, so please uh, be careful. Now comes to current assets inventory one eighty one thirty. Uh, current assets inventory one eighty plus one thirty. Uh, then of uh, trade receivable five twenty plus two seventy trade receivable five twenty plus seventy cash and cash equivalent two sixty plus one forty five cash and cash equivalent two sixty plus one forty five. Others is three fifty and one seventy five. Right? Uh, can you please uh, total it off? Comes to four uh, hundred plus five hundred minus seventy five. Eight twenty five. Uh, five seventy. Then uh, three hundred and ten. Then uh, seven ninety. Then uh, two sixty. Uh, four. Four not five. Three fifty plus one seventy five is. What is the total? Uh, eight zero plus five seven zero plus three one zero plus seven nine zero plus four plus five five. Three four two. Plus. E plus one forty five. Just a minute. Plus one six. Correct. What is total coming to? Yeah, correct. C eight twenty five plus five seventy plus three one zero plus seven nine zero plus four zero five plus five two five. Three four two five. Correct only. Now comes the equity part. Okay, so first is share capital, equity share capital, equity share capital is how much? For uh, J is six hundred. But uh, remember that J has issued shares also to uh, uh, shareholders of K, right? How many shares? How many shares it has issued? Come here. These are the number of shares issued, right? So please calculate four fifty divided by hundred. 
into 0.75 into 2 by 3 is 2.25 at 50 2.25 at 50 so meaning thereby out of 50 10 is the face value 40 is the securities premium so what is the value 2.25 into 10 is 22.5 is equity share capital and uh, 2.25 into 40 that is uh, 90 is securities premium okay so let's add it up 22.5 is 622.50 uh, other equity how much 725 for the parent right here 725 for the parent plus 90 is a securities premium on issue of shares plus 302.98 is the gain on bargain purchase if i'm not wrong 302.98 right uh now what is what further 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 a minute 2.4 is for sbp reserve for pre combination award sbp reserve 2.4 is sbp uh, reserve right uh so let's add it up so it's 725 plus uh, 90 plus 302.98 uh, plus 2.4 0.38 then comes nci is 150.56 right now uh, comes uh, non current liabilities non current liabilities finance a uh, long term borrowings is 350 plus 250 uh, long term borrowing is 350 plus 250 uh, which is 600 and further uh, long term one again long term provision is 70 plus 80 so you can write uh, below this deferred consideration also this was 33.81 then long term provision is 70 plus 80 is uh, 150 right then there is a deferred tax liability how much Deferred tax liability is 40 plus 20. But again, there is an adjustment. There was a deferred tax asset also, right? So 40 plus 20 minus deferred tax asset of minus deferred tax asset of 24.75 gives you a value of 60 minus 24.75 is 35.25. 30 plus 20. Plus, right. Now current liability is 125 plus 145. Current uh, liability is a financial uh, liability, short term financial liability is uh, how much? 260 plus 145 from now. 125 plus 145. 125 plus 145 is 270. Right, and trade purposes is 250 plus 8 payables is uh, 250 plus 185 250 plus 185 435 just let's check if we have covered everything gain on bargain purchase yes we covered nci yes we covered uh, fair value of the net assets uh, okay yes yeah, 7.5 we didn't cover right so let me write that also current liabilities uh, this one uh, provision for uh, contingent liability 7.5 also so this uh, this we adjusted this we adjusted this we adjusted this is also sorted uh, investments uh, part uh, this we adjusted this we adjusted this we also we adjusted so everything is sorted here also now let's uh, add it up it's total so it's 622.5 plus uh, 1120.38 plus uh, 150.56 plus Six uh is one eight nine three point four four okay uh then six hundred plus thirty three point eight one plus uh one fifty plus thirty five point two five eight one nine point zero six though my uh 
Yes, uh, there is a challenge in the presentation as of now in my solution. But yes, my point of view is to discuss the concepts. Okay, as of now, 270 plus 435 plus 7.5 is 712.5. Now let's add it up everything. So 189, uh, 1890.44 plus 819.06 uh, plus 712.5 is 24 to And three four two five the balancing. I hope uh, it is very much clear to all of you. Come on, guys, please confirm. Is it clear to everyone? Question. I believe uh, this question would have given you a sense of understanding of the overall concepts as well. okay now moving on to the next topic anyone having any queries in this one so far whatever we have discussed anyone having any queries the topics that we have discussed come on guys tell me this question was uh, i believe this is one of the good questions uh, so that's the reason uh, i have taken it up okay let's move on to the next concept that is loss of control understand guys loss of control but before we study loss of control, tell me, when we gain control on the date of acquisition, what do we do? We recognize goodwill, sorry, we recognize net assets, we recognize goodwill, we recognize NCI, we de-recognize investments and the, right, that's what we do, that's what we do, that's what we do. We open up the box of investment, we open up a box of investment and uh, from the box comes uh, the net assets, uh, the, we can say the goodwill or you can say the NCI. Now, when we are the control is lost, we are again closing the box. So, in the box again, we are uh, giving uh, the net assets, we are giving the NCI, we are giving the goodwill, right? We will wrap up, we will wrap up the box with the sale proceeds. The difference is the gain or loss on loss of control. So, again, what we'll do? We'll de recognize, we will de recognize the net assets on the date of loss of control the goodwill on the date of loss of control the nci on the date of loss of control will recognize the sale proceeds and will uh, continue to record the investments that we have retained if any at the fair value on such date now what is the meaning of investments ret retained loss of control means two things 60 percent to zero percent is a loss of control 60 percent to 40 percent is also a loss of control right so even though we have sold only 20 percentage but it is a case of loss of control okay going by our default classification on the basis of percentage right so uh, this is also a loss of control this is also a cost of loss of control so this 40 percent will be recorded at fair value on the date of loss of control okay so this is what is the accounting treatment of, treatment of loss of control the general entry if you have to see bank account debit with the sale proceeds nci account debit with the value of the nci and the date of loss of control investment returns at the fair value on the date of loss of control goodwill uh, on the will credit it off net assets will credit it off the difference if any will be transferred to gain or loss on loss of control which will be transferred to console candle so this uh, the gain or loss on control uh, calculated in this manner will be recorded in console pnl not in standalone pnl in standalone pnl will simply com compare the carrying amount of the cost of investments with the sale proceeds the difference will be transferred to gain or loss in standalone or the separate financial statements of the parent company okay so the amount uh, of gain or loss will be different in the separate fs and the console fs i hope that is clear to everyone okay so this concept is also done now the next concept is the uh, okay the last concept of this part this this part then we'll moving on to the uh, next part that is joint arrangements after the break okay so let's com complete this part sale or purchase without a uh, change of control or loss of control or gaining control there can be multiple aspects of it uh, it can be either 60 percent to can be 60 to 80 or it can be uh, 70 to 55 now whether I move from 60 to 80 or I move from 70 to 55, the control remains intact. There is no impact on the control. There is no impact on the control. But yes, my in, uh, ownership reduces or increases. But the control again remains intact. So what is the treatment? See guys understand. 
but understand understand when we increase from 60 to 80 nci reduces from 40 to 20 and when something reduces we reduce it proportionately when something reduces we reduce it proportionately so understand uh, purchase of shares is also called as reduction of nci and why i am writing as reduction of nci is simple link when the nci reduces reduce it proportionately reduce it proportionately that is carrying amount of nci divided by 40 percent multiplied by 20 percent reduce it that way okay so reduce nci proportionately reduce means debit nci proportionately credit to bank means we have purchased means we have purchased we have purchased shares right so what will i i will have to pay the money so to bank the difference is gain or loss on purchase okay so nci will be reduced uh pro rata value of nci bank will be the amount paid but when we sell our shares when we sell our shares when we sell our shares means uh the nci increases now something in when something increases it doesn't increase proportionately okay uh, when something increases it increases at its own value now comes the, what is the value of nci at which it should increase understand parent company is selling some of its interest to nci now right so definitely the parent company will uh, when the parent company sells when the parent company sells its interest to nci definitely it will recover definitely the parent company will try to recover the excess money that it paid on the date of acquisition it will try to recover the excess money that it paid on the date of acquisition right so over and above the value of net assets the parent company will also try to recover the value of goodwill okay so what we have to do we have to see on the date of acquisition what is the value of net assets 100 percent what is the value of goodwill and what is the percentage that we are selling what is the percentage that we are selling is the value of the increased goodwill is the value of the increased portion that increased portion of goodwill or uh, nci okay so that's that's the portion which you have to increase nci with this is the this is how we have to calculate nci bank will write with the sale proceeds the difference will be gain on loss on the sale of sale of nci i hope that is clear to everyone here okay so uh, this completes our discussion on uh, the console fs right uh, now uh, we'll take a quick break of 10 minutes and after that uh, we'll start our new topic that is a uh, joint arrangement but yes if you have any queries uh, in the meantime definitely we can discuss uh, otherwise you can take a break also of 10 minutes okay now we are breaking here for 10 minutes okay? uh, let's resume back guys uh, so uh, <coughs> now let's discuss the next topic that is uh, joint arrangements now uh, having discussed all the points today that uh, basically about what is, what is the accounting treatment the sfs of the parent or the cfs what is the accounting treatment on the date of acquisition on the each reporting dates also we prepared a balance sheet uh, console balance sheet to understand the, all the concepts uh, whatever we have shared so far now moving on to some specific situations like you can say uh, joint arrangements right uh, what is the meaning of joint arrangement so standard says uh, any arrangement if there is any arrangement if there is any arrangement between two or more parties that have joint control that have joint control is called as a joint arrangement now okay uh, basically joint arrangement means uh, any uh, arrangement between two or more parties having joint control so the key important term here or key term or an important term here is joint control so if there are two or more parties and they have joint control they do have joint control over a third entity so we need to understand what is the meaning of joint control uh, and if joint control exists we will say that joint arrangement exists okay now to understand the meaning of joint arrangement we need to understand the meaning of joint control so a uh, standard says uh, joint control means uh, parties having understanding have control parties having understanding means uh, there is an understanding so first point that is uh, important is parties have understanding second is you they have unanimous consent they have unanimous consent meaning basically meaning thereby uh, if the, when they are taking decisions when they are taking decisions they take unanimous consent mean all the parties has to agree all the parties has to agree to a point it is then only uh, they will take a decision basically it means uh, even though there are two or more parties even though there are let's suppose there are part two or more parties a b and c for a joint control to exist means whenever they have to take any decision all of them have to agree meaning thereby they have to become one they have to become one they have to become one if they become one and take a unanimous consent and take a decision that is called as a joint control that is called a joint control okay they have an understanding between them and they take unanimous consent of each parties and then only take a decisions that is called as a joint control but now understand understand let's suppose uh, this party is having 20% this party is having 20% this party is having 20% can a individually take any decisions 
has does, does a have the power to take independently any decisions no does b has the power independent to take any decisions no does c has the power independent to take any decisions no does a and b accumulative has the power no a b and c when it uh, accumulates when it accumulates okay that okay, accumulate their power uh, they, it is then they give it gives rise to control okay then it called it is called as joint control but now taking another situation let's suppose here a has 60 percent b has 20 and c has 20 percent okay now even though there is an understanding between them even though they take unanimous consent but in in cases in cases a has the right to take the decisions independently as well so it will not be a case of joint control so standard says a uh, joint control means joint control means there is an understanding there is a unanimous consent and no party has the standalone control no parties has the standalone control so that's what i have tried to explain with the help of this example see uh, there are three parties a b and c and uh, the uh, control of the interest of a is 15 percent the b is 10 percent and c is 55 percent enter into an arrangement to jointly control d so is this a joint arrangement now first you have to say is this a joint control now to assess a joint control to assess a joint control this this party c party has standalone control also since c has standalone control as well we will not we will conclude that it is not a case of joint control and since it is not a joint control it is not a case of joint arrangement even though there is an understanding and they take unanimous consent but still it is not a joint control and not a joint arrangement i believe all of you are understanding this point okay so that's what i have written here though there is an arrangement between a b and c but since uh, a has standalone control uh, joint control does not exist and hence this is not a joint arrangement i believe this is clear to all of you okay so joint arrangement exists when there is a joint control joint arrangement exists when there is a joint control joint control exists when there is a uh, understanding when there is an understanding and uh, when there is a unanimous consent Okay, and uh, no single party has the control. Okay, so that's when uh, joint control exists. That's when joint control exists. Okay, I believe it is clear to you all of you the meaning. Now understand, uh, standard says the joint arrangement can be of two types. The joint arrangement can be of two types. One is joint operation, another is joint venture. One is joint operation, another is joint venture. Okay, now. Uh, how to classify whether the joint arrangement is in the nature of joint operation or a joint uh, venture how to classify that okay. the classification is a uh, is a question is a question okay now let's understand how to classify standard says that standard says the assess is the joint arrangement structured is the joint arrangement structured structured means uh, any separate entity floated for that any separate entity floated for that okay uh, now basically when a b and c are together have they formed a new entity have they formed a new entity to uh, through which they are they uh, they through which they represent as a single entity through which they represent as a single control okay so uh, is it structured is it structured if the answer to that is no if it is not structured then it is conclusive evidence that it is a joint operation if it is not structured it is a conclusive evidence that it is a joint operation but if it is structured if it is structured is it a conclusive evidence that uh, it is a case of joint venture no 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 it says that if if it is structured if it is structured then we have to assess does the party have the right to what parties to joint operate joint arrangement has the right to what if they have the right to specific assets and liabilities it's a case of joint operation if the right to net assets it's a case of joint venture i will explain the meaning i'll explain the meaning of this one let's suppose uh, if uh, in a joint arrangement uh, let's suppose me and one more party is having uh, uh, are the joint operators uh, are the joint uh, parties to joint arrangement okay let's suppose uh, vj and uh, one more uh, let's suppose <coughs> a and b are the parties to joint arrangement are the parties to joint arrangement this is joint arrangement this is a joint arrangement now in the joint arrangement if a uh, okay the parties to the arrangement say that i have 60 percent or i have let's suppose uh 30 percent the right to net assets whatever are the net assets okay the assets minus liabilities i have to take 30 percent of it means it's a joint venture 
बट इफ बी से इफ द पार्टी से आई हैव थर्टी परसेंट राइट ओवर द असेट्स आई हैव फोर्टी परसेंट राइट ओवर द लाइबिलिटीज आई हैव फुल राइट ओवर द एक्सपेंसिस आई हैव दॉरी फुल ऑब्लिगेशन ओवर द एक्सपेंसिस आई हैव फिफ्टी परसेंट राइट ओवर द रेवेन्यू so basically there are specific rights specific obligations over the assets and liabilities incomes and expenses then it become joint operation then it become joint operation okay meaning thereby the, the rights and obligations are specific okay are specific are specific to assets and liabilities meaning thereby uh, let's suppose it can be the possibly be the case that this building whole is mine this uh, full liability is yours i will say like this then in in this case i will say this is a case of joint operation not a joint venture okay Joint venture means what? I have a right to net assets. Means whatever are the net assets, I will take thirty percent of that. Okay, so that's what is called joint uh, venture. Now, so you have to analyze two things: is it structured or not? If not structured, joint operation. If structured, right to what? Right to what? Right to net assets, a joint venture. A right to specific assets and specific liabilities, then it's a joint operation again. Okay. Now comes the question: What should be the treatment? what should be the treatment of a joint operation and a joint venture accounting treatment so standard says the joint of the accounting treatment of joint operation is covered under indes triple 1 itself the same standard which we are studying now but the accounting treatment of joint venture is a covered under indes 28 the uh, equity method and it's exactly the same as associates it's exactly the same as associates okay so the accounting treatment for associates and joint ventures are covered under indes 28 and they are accounted for under equity method equity method equity equity method okay now accounting treatment of joint operations is what we have to study now okay because joint venture we will study in the indes 28 the next topic that we will that we are going to discuss today okay now accounting treatment of joint venture it says uh, it says that see in case of joint operation there is uh, no uh, there is no separate sfs and cfs sfs and cfs both are same itself sfs and cfs both are same itself right because there is no separate entity being floated in the case of joint operation right there is no separate entity being floated in case of joint operation so sfs and cfs both are same both are same and in the sfs or you can say cfs whatever you, whatever we want to say what we have to do is we have to record our share of assets or liabilities in joint operation our share of income or expenses in joint operation basically uh, what uh, what will a joint operator the party to joint operation are called a joint operators okay point uh, sfs of joint operator okay so what will they do uh, they will write their own uh, revenue of a uh, joint operator basically revenue of the standalone revenue of joint operator plus share of revenue share of revenue from joint operation from joint operation from joint operation okay i'll write here full because jo both are jo right so you might get confused from joint operation own revenue is own revenue plus share of revenue from joint operation is what we have to they will record okay now similarly uh, for expenses also similarly for assets also similarly for liabilities also don't worry we'll take up a question and explain also that don't worry okay now what happens uh, understand understand uh, this is one of the adjustment uh, which the examiner might ask what happens is it says uh, what should be the accounting treatment if uh, an asset is either sold by joint operator to jo joint operation or sold by uh, joint operation to joint operator okay what should be the treatment what should be the treatment what should be the understand guys let's suppose when the joint operator sells the assets to joint operation okay so understand joint operator sells the asset to joint operation operation the 100% asset is oh, I, I, earlier the 100% asset was owned by joint operator Let's suppose the share is fifty fifty. Share is fifty fifty of joint. There are two parties of joint operator. There are two joint operators, and the share is fifty fifty. Let's assume. Let's assume. Let's assume. Now, what happens when uh, the joint operator sells the uh, asset to joint operation? Sells the asset to joint operation. What will happen is still fifty percent. Ah, fifty percent ownership will be with the joint operator, and the fifty percent will be with the other operator. other operator right so what happens only the 50% control over the asset gets lost right only the share of the other joint operator gets lost so that's what we have to do 
when the assets are sold by joint operator to joint operation recognize sale only to the extent of share of other parties in the joint operation and similarly here also if i am purchasing any asset from joint operation if i am purchasing any assets from joint operation okay then what will have i purchase only to the extent of share of other parties in joint operation because let's suppose uh, there is an asset in joint operation there was a let's suppose there, this was a calculator which was there in the operation okay uh 50 50 percent share so 50 percent uh share of, of a calculator was already by mine right now when i purchase this so i will pay only the for the 50 percent part because 50 percent what i have already paid in the past i hope you are able to understand that I'll, I'll i'll take one simple example to explain this what the concept let's suppose joint operation purchase an asset costing uh rupees 1 lakhs okay so definitely uh, 50000 was brought in by joint operator 1 50000 was brought in by joint operator number 2 <coughs> right now <coughs> uh if <coughs> the same was sold to joint operator number 2 okay if this asset was sold to joint operator number 2 tell me how much the joint operator number 2 should bring additionally at what price it should be sold uh, it should be sold at 1 lakh or 50,000 because joint operator 2 has already paid 50,000 for this in the past so now if you want to purchase if joint operator number 2 wants to purchase this asset from the joint operation he has to pay his share only right so that's what I'm trying to say here now uh, you have an illustration on joint operation accounting so let's uh, read the question and try to understand it okay it says ab limited and bc limited have established a joint arrangement uh, through separate vehicle separate vehicle means it can be a case of joint operation or joint venture okay we have to analyze it the legal form of the separate vehicle does not confer separation uh, confer separation between the parties and the separate vehicle itself thus both the parties have the right to assets and obligations or the liabilities of pqr Basically, it says AB and BC Limited. There are two parties, AB Limited and BC Limited. Uh, they control PQR. Okay, they control uh, PQR. Okay, now uh, so it says uh, it says uh, the AB and BC, AB and BC, AB and BC have the right to assets and liabilities of PQR. Have the right to assets and liabilities of PQR, not the right to net assets. So ideally, it appears ideally it appears to be a joint operation so far. Now, as neither the contractual terms nor other facts and circumstances indicate otherwise, it is concluded that the arrangement is a joint operation and not a joint venture. The question itself says that it is a case of joint operation and not a joint venture. Otherwise, you were, you were required to analyze and conclude whether it is a case of joint operation and joint venture, in which case we would have concluded as a joint operation. Okay, But here the question itself says, so there is no point uh, assessing that. Okay, Now, it says both the parties own 50% of each of the equity interest. 50% of each of the equity interest in PQR. However, the contractual terms uh, of the joint operation or arrangement state that AB Limited has the right to all of the building number one. Building number one is fully owned by AB Limited. Okay. Uh, <coughs> the obligation to pay all the debt owned by PQR to a lender XYZ. Okay. Uh, this is fully for AB. Okay and bc limited has the right to all other assets of pqr and obligations for all other liabilities of pqr in proportion of their equity interest 50 percent each so what uh, okay how should ab record in the financial statements of the right okay now how will ab record in the books of ab so let's prepare the books of ab so first it will record assets Assets, it will write building number one that is fully owned by AB. So I will write 240. Building number two is 50 percent here, right? So I will write 100. Cash 50 percent, I will write 20, right? Then uh, comes uh, equity and liabilities, right? Now, uh, liability is fully owned by AB, debt is uh, 240 okay now employee benefit obligation is uh, nothing is mentioned so i will write here 50 percent of it is 50 and then uh, equity is again 50 20 i write here 50 percent of it 
right so this is how it will be recorded in the books of ab i believe that is clear to all of you come on guys tell me so that uh, that completes our discussion on uh, joint arrangement and joint operations right the accounting treatment for joint venture will be discussed in india 28 okay which we'll discuss now now the next topic that we have to study is uh, in days 28 uh, that deals with uh, accounting uh, for investments in associates and joint ventures right so just uh, right now we complete topic for joint arrangement we completed topic on joint arrangement which had two parts joint operation and joint venture right and joint operation accounting we already discussed so joint venture is covered here right associates meaning uh, any entity over which we have significant influence is also covered here right uh, now let's uh, let's discuss it off what is the meaning of associate uh, any entity on which the investor has significant influence what is the meaning of significant influence means uh, the voting power of 20 percent or more the default the default the default classification okay uh, the uh, again significant influence also means the power to participate in the financial and operating decisions of the entity or you can say the power to part uh, power to appoint at least one director in the board meeting of the company in the board of directors of the company okay so that the the, the director which i have appointed has a power right to participate in the decision making not the right to take decisions but the right to participate is that uh, uh, you can say uh, it's called a significant influence okay now accounting treatment of associate or joint venture in the SFS of parent uh, it can be at cost or fair value uh, in console FS it has to measure at equity method it has to measure at equity method now understand uh, what is the meaning of equity method is basically equity method uh, is nothing but uh, similar to NCI is similar to NCI understand what happens listen to me very carefully here. listen to me very carefully uh when this is a, let's suppose this is an investing company this is a company x limited uh this is a company called y limited x limited owns 60 percent of this one and 40 percent is owned by let's suppose z limited okay now uh for what happens what happens so this is for x limited this is subsidiary and z limited becomes nci right that becomes becomes z limited becomes nci right now for z limited for z limited x y limited becomes what associate meaning thereby meaning thereby x limited in the console financial statements will rep, uh, will record a payable will record a payable to nci now z limited in the console fs will record a receivable from y limited now receivable from y limited okay now this receivable will be called as uh, investments in equity shares of uh, y limited at equity method and this payable is called as non controlling interest the measurement is exactly the same the measurement process is exactly the same right so what we do in nci we measure at cost uh, we measure it either at a fair value or proportionate share of a uh, 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 fair proportionate share method right here in the associate we measure it initially at cost we measure initially at cost which represents the fair value uh, on that date okay then further we increase or decrease uh, uh, to give the effect of change in the net assets from date of acquisition and that's what we do here in nci as well that's what we do here in nci as well right so uh, what happens equity method of associate equity method of associate is exactly like uh, uh, is exactly like nci so basically the eval in uh, when we follow equity method of uh, valuation of investment associate in that case the investment figure represents the share of net assets represents the share of net assets that uh, uh, of the uh, of the associate company okay basically uh, understand uh, if, if if i have if i have a 30 percent interest in a company okay uh, that company is my associate that means that company is my associate by default classification so uh, if it's my associate definitely i don't have control and i cannot record all the assets and all the liabilities right i cannot do that but i do have an ownership of 30 percent so what i'll do i will record i will uh, revalue my investments on each reporting date so that this value of investment represents this value of represents represents the share of net assets of the associate company okay so that's what we are doing here see so what is my cost 
what is the profit or loss earned post acquisition from after date of acquisition by the associate company uh, oci and any changes in the net assets okay in the post acquisition period that will give you the value of investment in associate okay uh, now if there is any unrealized profit all the other things that we adjust exactly like we do in subsidiary we will do it here but yes uh, in subsidiary we what we do we record all the assets line by line and then we record nci but rather what we will do i will record only my share here that's what okay and i will add in the investments that's what I do here. Now, ad important adjustments, important adjustments. Okay, now. <coughs> dividend uh, paid by uh, associate. Dividend paid by associate. Basically, understand what happens here. When the dividend paid by associate to so parent companies. When the parent company receives the dividend. When the parent company uh, receives the dividend. Understand what happens. Uh, it will be called dividend income. So, we have to knock off that. We have to knock off that. We have to knock off that. Okay. That's what add back the whole amount of dividend uh, to statement net assets exactly the same what we studied uh, uh, in subsidiary thing right if opening and closing re is given if opening and closing re is given and the dividend payout is given then add back the dividend and arrive at the correct amount of profits and from this profit you can uh, 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 attribute to pre and post period uh, right allocate to pre and post period so that you uh, arrive at a correct amount of a retained earning on the date of acquisition right so the, this logic remains the same only thing that you have to do differential is uh, reduce the value of uh, dividends from the console PNL and from the value of investments, right? From the value of investments in associate, right? Uh, now, unrealized profit on inventory, unrealized profit on inventory. Okay, so it can be again upstream, downstream. Now, in both the cases, it will impact console PNL. Why? Understand. Upstream means what? associate sales to parent company who has earned the profit who has earned the profit uh, associate company has earned the profit so associate company's profit uh, goes in what a statement of net assets or you can write here or you can write here share of profit of associate uh, and where is this uh, merged this gets merged in the console p and l right that's why I have written here console PNL. Many students will get confused why we are writing console PNL. So, see, uh, the profit of associate is represented by share of profit of associate as single line item in the PNL, which ultimately goes to console PNL. So, what we have, I have written here console PNL. Count right now. Who has the inventory? Parent has the inventory. Parent has the inventory, right? And the parent is recording the inventory. So, I will do create inventory. But now, if it is downstream, if it is a downstream, Meaning thereby, uh, parent has sold to associate. Who has earned the profit? Parent. So what will I do? Debit console PNL. But who has the inventory? Associate has the inventory. Now associates inventory are we recording? No. So where are, where is it getting reflected in the investments in associate? Right. So I will write here not inventory. Uh, it is wrong. I will write here investment in associate. But again there is one challenge here. What I shouldn't make a mistake. Always, always, always. They deduct the, they pass this under general interest or they do this adjustment with the whole amount, with the whole amount of unrealized profit. No guys, no, no, no. We have to do it only with our share, with our share in associate. Okay, unrealized profit multiplied by associate percentage. Do not forget to multiply it with associate percentage. Do not forget to multiply it with associate percentage. Okay, now let's solve a question. Let's solve a question. Uh, the question is in front of you guys. All of you, please read the question and try to solve it. Come on guys. <clears throat> so the question says on 1st April uh, 19, uh, Big Limited acquired 35% interest in Dig Limited. Okay. Five percent interest in Dig Limited on 1st April uh, 19. Okay, and achieved a significant influence. The cost of the investment, the cost of the investment was 3 lakhs. Okay, uh, now what is the requirement? Calculate Big Limited interest in Dig Limited. Okay, now so basically it says you have to calculate the value of investments on 31st uh, March 2020. I will uh, follow a different approach here. Okay, on 1st April 19. And 31st March 20. The question is asking what is the value of investment in associate here? Okay. 
uh, in the console finance statements will calculate and in the SFS also will calculate. Here it says the question says here the cost was 3 lakhs. Now let's read the question further and try to understand. Dig Limited has net assets of 550,000 on 1st April 1919. It says the, the, the Dig Limited had net assets of 5.5 lakh here. Okay. Uh, the fair value of the net assets was 6.5 lakh. Okay, and the fair value was 6.5. So I'm not concerned about uh, this one. Uh, carrying amount, I'm concerned more about uh, this one. You can say fair value. So I will write here uh, this one on the date of acquisition. Okay, uh, this is reporting date. This is post period, right? Now, so fair value adjustment is one lakhs. Okay, further, further, what it say? Since the fair value of the pro property plan and equipment is 1 lakh higher than the book value. Okay, fine. The property plan and equipment have a remaining useful life of 8 years uh, for the financial year 1920. Okay, now, so it says uh, the life is 10 years. So, definitely if I am doing fair value adjustment, I have to do consequential uh, excess depreciation also, right? So, uh, excess depreciation will be uh, for 1 lakh divided by what is the life? Uh, life is uh, 8 years. And how many years is this is one year multiplied by one year is the excess depreciation so what is the amount uh, one by is 0 0.125 okay. now for the for the financial year 1920 this financial year for this this financial year for this financial year it says For this financial year, it says Dig Limited earned a profit for uh, okay. Now, it says a profit or oh, profit. I write here profit. Profit earned was 1 lakhs. Profit earned was 1 lakh for this year. Fine. And paid a dividend of uh, dividend of 11,000 out of these profits. Okay, fine. Uh, Dig Limited also recognized a loss of 15,000 that arose from the uh, remeasurement of the defined benefit of uh, directly in the other comprehensive income okay now so uh, these two adjustments i am keeping it separate but now i am closing it off here so uh, now tell me what is the valuation what is the valuation so here on the post equation it is uh, 1 lakhs minus 12500 is 87500 87500 right so what happens see under equity method cost of investment guys listen to me very carefully here cost of investment was 3 lakhs okay cost of investment was 3 lakh now now fair value adjustment was done on the date of acquisition so it will not have any impact on this one okay valuation of investments now further 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 because that uh, because any adjustment done on date of acquisition impacts the goodwill not uh, the valuation of investments now further what is the profit earned by the associate during the year 1 lakhs right so 1 lakh or and what is our interest 35 percent right so 1 lakh multiplied by 35 percent is is what 35,000 now excess depreciation on fair value adjustment was how much 12,500 right uh, multiplied by 35 percent so why 35 percent because our sale is 35 percent right so what is the excess depreciation 12500 multiplied by 0.35 is 4375 now again uh, dividend paid i will again remove it off from here right why because see understand this value of investment in associate as per equity method represents what is the value what is the amount that i that is uh, that i am supposed to receive from the associate company but if i have something received actually received something let's suppose if i am saying that i am supposed to receive 10 uh, 10 rupees and now i receive 2 rupees so will i still show a receiver of 10 rupees no i will reduce it to 8 rupees right so that's what i'm doing i'm re reducing what i've actually received so dividend paid is how much dividend paid is how much tell me Dividend of 11,000 is paid. So 11,000 was paid overall. So I would have received 35% of it. Right. So what is the 35% of 11,000? It's 3850. I have received. Okay. Now OCI. Loss in OCI is uh, 15,000. OCI loss is 15,000. Multiply 35 percentage. How much? 
So what is the net balance? Three lakhs plus thirty-five thousand minus four three seven five minus three eight five zero minus five two five zero comes to three two one. Comes to three two one five two. I hope that is clear. That is called as uh, valuation of investments in associate at equity method. I hope it is clear to all of you. It and now moving further. Associate to subsidiary. Associate to subsidiary. Understand, guys. Associate to subsidiary means what? Earlier I was holding a uh, thirty percentage, and I it was an associate. Now again I acquired further stake. Or uh, let's suppose I acquired further. Further I acquired twenty five percentage, and I become fifty five percentage. Right. So it is like I was an associate earlier. And now I become a subsidiary. Now I become a subsidiary. Now I become a subsidiary. Okay. Now I become a subsidiary. Now I become a subsidiary. Okay. Now, so what happens? Uh, what should be the treatment of this one? The standard says. Uh, so, uh, as if you can recall, uh, in today's class itself, we studied that something something like this happens. It is called as a step acquisition. It is called as step acquisition. It is called as step acquisition, right? So, what we do in step acquisition? Leave apart the concepts. Uh, what do we do in step acquisition? In step acquisition, in the SFS, we uh, remeasure the previously acquired interest. We measure, we re we remeasure the previously acquired interest uh, at fair value on the date of acquisition. And in the console FS, definitely what we will do is uh, we will uh, de-recognize the investments, we will recognize the net assets, we will recognize the NCI, we will recognize the goodwill and uh, account for it in that manner. Okay, basically we will prepare the console financial statements okay, uh, using the control approach. I hope that is clear to all of you using uh, for the step acquisition part. Now moving on to loss making associate or joint venture. This concept is very uh, easy to understand. It says if there is an associate or joint venture which is continuously making losses. Okay. So definitely what happens if it is continuously making losses we will uh, we'll, uh, use equity method and we will uh, keep on reducing the value of investments we will keep on re reducing the value of investments but a time will come a time will come when this value of investment will become zero and still the associate is making losses then what will we do in that case what will we do the so standard says that if that is the case any subsequent losses will adjust if we do have any investment preferences of associate i will adjust from there I will adjust from there and or if uh, if this also gets extinguished okay exhausted then i will adjust if there is any long-term loans for associate i will adjust from there so basically uh if thus associate or a subsidy uh, sorry associate or a joint venture makes losses continuously first of all i will uh, write off that loss my share of our loss from investment in equity shares then from then from investment in uh preference shares of that associate of that associate not others associate okay then investment in uh, long term loans now it is, it is it is this was the case when the associate company is continuously making losses but what if that that same same associate starts making profit then i will again uh, adjust the profits with first with long term loans then with preference shares and then with investment in equity shares Okay, so that's what. So when it comes to losses, equity shares are the most exposed, and when it comes to profits, it's the last. It's the last. It's the last. Okay, so that's what is the treatment. That's what is the treatment. Okay, now I do have a question also written on this one. It's the same, exactly the same. Okay, so it's uh, value is given for equity shares, preference shares, long term loans, uh, and also the losses is given here. So you can uh, read the question and try to solve it. There is nothing difficult in this one. Okay, uh, yes, and if you have any queries, definitely we can discuss in the next class. Okay, so that's all for the day, guys. Uh, in the next class, we will be discussing with some special situations of business combination uh, that uh, that is basically the case of chain holding, reverse acquisition, common control business transactions. Or and some theory topics like the meaning of control, the significant influence, and all the all other things we'll discuss and uh, close it off. Okay, so that's all for today. Thank you. Bye bye.